Welcome you to the final day of the uh, We're going to go ahead and get started, so I'd ask everyone to take their seats. And I don't have many announcements today because we're in the final stretch, but I just wanted to tell you that we are starting with our first panel today, which will be followed by a short coffee break around 11. And then after the break, at, starting at 11.15, we'll invite all of our panelists back up to the stage for a final discussion. And then we'll conclude the conference. So I'd like to introduce our moderator for the day, Ben Kashore, and he'll be introducing the first panel. Thank you. Hey, good, mor uh, good morning. Good morning. Can you hear me OK? OK. Um, first of all, uh, let me say my name is Ben Kashore, and um, I'm very sorry I couldn't make the conference yesterday. I had classes and a faculty meeting, but I saw the, uh, the list of speakers, and I imagine it was a very, uh, really important and productive uh, uh, day. Um, before I introduce the speakers, I want to give you a little bit of my background so you know where I'm coming from in these questions. So I am a uh, political scientist, and I work mostly on questions of forest policy and governance. And I began my career looking at uh, Canadian and U.S. forest policies. And then I realized whatever happens in Canada and the U.S. actually impacts other regions of the world. So I switched to Europe, and then I switched to private mechanisms like forest certification and realized that actually markets uh, uh, impact global dynamics. And now we're working on uh, Southeast Asia and the impact of certification and things like legality verification on uh, really intractable problems like uh, deforestation and forest degradation. Uh, so out of all of this research has come the concern that if you look back at the last 20 years of efforts to improve forest policy and governance across the world, the challenge, we find two challenges that need to be overcome and that I think this panel begins to overcome. And the first challenge is a whack-a-mole challenge. Now, whack-a-mole is this game um, that kids play, um, in North America anyway, where you whack a mole with a hammer and in one circle, and, but in another circle, the mole comes back up over here. And so you have to hit the mole over here, but then in a third circle, the mole comes up over here. Okay? And the problem is that you solve one problem somewhere, and you cause another problem somewhere else. So often people say that when we say the northern spotted owl in the U.S. Pacific Northwest by reducing logging there, you ended up increasing logging in Indonesia and Southeast Asia. And so solving the whack-a-mole problem becomes really important for all of us collectively uh, at the global level, but also at local scales. The other problem that's related to the whack-a-mole problem is that, is that we, by not addressing the whack-a-mole problem, we have very short term attention spans um, regarding the latest policy initiative or metaphor to address these problems. So if you go back 20 years, what do we see? We see five-year attention spans on policy instruments and policy metaphors from tropical boycott campaigns to global forest convention efforts to forest certification efforts to criterion and indicators efforts, and now we have Red Plus and legality verification. Uh, and now we also have different framing. So now we, we used to have uh, forests by themselves as being important. And now it's forests if climate is important with forests, because the problem definition is better that way. But the problem, as our panelists will talk about, is what happens when you frame forests in a climate framework. And now we have the latest being uh, forests and food security. And I hadn't really thought of this before, but now this is the thing we all care about, is forests and food security, because norms shape how we think about these things. And of course now it's no longer ecosystem management, it's ecosystem services. And so they matter if we have a service they provide, like when you go to a restaurant and you order food, if they provide a service to you, they actually matter. Okay? So all these things actually affect us because we really want to create durable approaches to addressing these problems that don't let us, in five years from now, having a new metaphor, maybe not food security, but now something else we haven't thought about, right? because we keep getting frustrated by the pace and scale of change. And so I think these, this panel allows us to think about these questions in this kind of context. Now, do they actually make a difference, and how might they actually be important? So I think this is going to be a really productive 
panel in that regard. Um, one thing, we are going to be draconian on the time limits that each panelist has because the Q&A is always the best. Okay, so I'm announcing that. I will not let the panelists go over their allotted time. Okay? I'll actually stand up and stop them. Okay, that's the, the ground rule so we can have our Q&A. Which means I also must stop myself as well, um, which I will, now, I will now do. So our first um, presenter is uh, Jacques Pellini, who was initially trained in biology and agronomy and completed a PhD in natural resources studying the causes of deforestation in Madagascar from a social uh, science perspective. So it nicely brings in these complementary um, views and, and knowledge bases. Um, he worked in international rural development and conservation programs and currently combines consulting work for USAID uh, funded project FCMC, which we'll learn from Jacques what that acronym is, uh, with research activities at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign, both addressing forest governance and red uh, policies in Africa. And his title is wonderfully uh, provocative for thinking about these questions that I just raised. Red Plus and the Shifting Cultivation in DRC, Will Adaptation and Mitigation Turn Maladaptive? With that, welcome Jacques. Well, thanks for the great opportunity to be here. Um, okay, I won't repeat the title, the title, and then we go straight to the subject. Um, I guess you're familiar with the Red Plus already and with synthetic cultivation, but uh, in a few words, Red Plus uh, is about reducing emission from deforestation uh, through a mechanism which is based on uh, carbon trading. So I will go straight to the place where we did uh, this field work. Uh -oh. What's the trick? Which button? Okay. Okay, also this one. Yeah. Okay, so this uh, presentation is based, based on some field work which was done by three consultants, including myself. Uh, I was with two national consultants recruited in uh, DRC Congo. Uh, it's a work then for the project uh, Forest, Carbon, Market and Community, which is a readiness project uh, financed by USID. Um, so it, it's based on not a long time spending uh, on the field, uh, basically, we went to two places, Kesenge, which you can see here, and Lingomo, and both are in this grand forest of the Congo Basin, which is the second biggest uh, rainforest in the world. But this presentation today is only based on Lingomo, the second site, which you can see on the top of the slide. This is just to show you an idea of the, this grand forest uh, from the plain which brought us to that place, because that place is quite remote. There's no road going there. You have to fly. Uh, you have to even rent a plane to go there. Uh, and this is a typical settlement you find in this area. So you can see a road, but it's very narrow. It can only be practiced, only be used by motorbikes and bikes. And you can see the, the people living around. They are smallholder farmers, and they practice shifting cultivation, uh, which you can see on this slide, and which consists in uh, clearing a piece of forest or secondary vegetation, and then uh, once you burn the, the, the vegetation, you can directly plant, in this case, corn and cassava, which are the two main crops. Cassava provides a staple, and corn is a, is a cash crop because they transform the corn into alcohol. And alcohol is easy to transport. You can put five, uh, 125 liters of alcohol on a, on a bike, and it, so it's easy to transport to some place where you can, you can sell it. Here you can see a mature field of cassava, and you can see the vegetation around. So the landscape is actually a mosaic of uh, secondary vegetation and fields until a distance of about five kilometers from the road, and beyond that distance is too far away. It will result in too much transportation cost for carrying the harvest, and so people stay close to the road, and the rest of the area is, is a grand forest that you saw on the former picture. But close to their house, they also have uh, other, other systems. They have uh, some sort of small forest garden. You can see here some coffee in the middle. 
And coffee actually used to be a very important cash crop in the past. So currently people are living out of the shifting cultivation system oriented to corn and cassava. But in the past, they were focusing on perennial crops because until the 80s, uh, there were actually some trucks, some uh, cars coming into this area. Uh, there was more infrastructure in the country and buyers came and the price of coffee and other perennial crops was higher so people were living actually much better than they do now and now you only find a few remaining uh, coffee uh, uh, trees like here and they also cultivate uh, palm oil which also used to provide some income but now it's almost abandoned and you can see also banana trees on this picture. Here you can see the coffee harvest, which is only sold locally. And here you can see a rubber tree plantation. There's also a large uh, plantation, private plantation, close to this area, which used to hire much labor force. But now it's uh, not really close, but uh, it doesn't produce a lot because the price of rubber is too low. Also, there could be a comeback of rubber tree cultivation because of uh, the price apparently coming up a little bit. But every farmer basically have a small plot of rubber trees, but they don't harvest them because the price is too low and no nobody buys. Here you can see the tool that people use. It's mostly the machete, which you can see here, and the axe, which are the basic tools to do shifting cultivation. You don't plow the land when you do shifting cultivation. You just sow directly after you burn. Uh, but the plow is used for making small gardens and also because uh, NGOs did introduce some new techniques and this is what we are going to, to see on the next pictures. Well, in complement to uh, agriculture, people also uh, go to the forest to, for hunting and fishing and collecting various products. And that's very important complement to the economy. Also, now uh, there is no, not many animals to hunt. The country was at war during 10 years, and until uh, for, for, during the 90s, people were actually leaving their settlement close to the road, and they hide in the forest to avoid the raid from you know, the military groups. And during that time, they really extensively lived from the forest, which was then like a shelter, but the consequence is that there is no much uh, game remaining. And so they have still those uh, small uh, camp in the forest, like you see on this picture, but um, uh, now uh, they really have to rely on agriculture because there is no much to find, no, don't, not so many things to find in the forest. Here, another picture of forest camp where you can see also the, the, the corn growing. They established some small fields, still shifting cultivation. Okay, now a few pictures from the work of the NGO. And uh, there's an intervention financed by uh, USID CARPE program. And it involves the NGO African Wildlife Foundation in partnership with the Center for International Agriculture, Tropical Agriculture. And here you can see a farmer showing his field. And so you can note, this is actually a crop that used to be practiced, but it's supported by the project, which introduced new techniques, which consist of making a crop rotation, plowing the land, sowing in line, and, uh, and um, cultivating two and a half years the same plot uh, instead of just cultivating uh, corn and cassava, which last about 18 months, and then abandoning the land into fallow. So it's the idea of intensification. Um, and, but you can see that this has some consequence. So the rotation involves some uh, cereals, like the, the, the rice, but also some legumes, like peanuts here, groundnut. Uh, but uh, the system has some consequence of, on the environment and also on the, on, on the economy. You can see here weeds which invade the plot because if you cultivate several years the same plot, you have a weed invasion. And uh, there were women, you know, I mean, this system was supported by the NGO through association of farmers, which include both men and women. But after one year or a little bit more, the women massively deserted the association and they explain us that this is because they just can't afford to do that very heavy work of getting rid of those weeds. So apparently the new system creates a new workload that people can't manage because of this weed invasion. But we have also to, um, I have to mention that in the same time that this system is also for producing seedlings because the project has a strategy of multiplication of seeds. 
Uh, and so they explain to us when we discuss this issue that uh, in the second step, uh, the farmer will appropriate the system by themselves and uh, they will, uh, it will be more flexible, so the technique eventually could be a little bit different from what is shown here. But still you have those ideas of crop rotation which uh, are expected to be at the core of the new technology that is proposed. And here you can see the weed invasion. And the project also introduced cover crop, which also have this effect of covering the land. And you can wonder how can the vegetation also develop in this environment. So probably it's going to have an impact on the fallow vegetation, on the recovery of the forest after the cultivation. And so this is also something that should be looked at to really know the impact of the technique uh, on the environment. Okay, so. You saw the big picture of those farming systems. So now let's synthesize a little bit. Uh, what was really striking for us is that we felt like there are really two ways to see intensification. One way is the so intensification, the purpose being to reduce the land that is under cultivation so you can keep more forest, which will then you know, be compatible with a, a red policy. So the farmers they have the idea of progressively intensifying. That means progressively reducing the fallow period, but still doing shifting cultivation, even if they complement with a few other things, like maybe perennial crops. But for the, for the, the project that intervenes and has red in, in, the, in the back mind, the idea is that shifting cultivation is bad. Shifting cultivation destroys the forest, so there has to be something else. So it's the idea of alternative, completely changing radically the system by introducing crop rotation, plowing the land, etc. And I think this contrast needs to be paid attention. Um, so what, what are the causes of this contrast? Well, one of the causes is the criteria that people have in mind to think about the new system. For a farmer, what matters is how much they can produce with their labor, you know? Uh, but the project has in mind yield. Any agronomist, any uh, extension agent you speak with will be concerned by yield. But yield doesn't tell you how much you produce. Yield doesn't does tell you how much the land is producing. But if you have high yield, but that it requires so much work that you only can cultivate a small piece of land, you will have higher yield and lower production. So that's one important aspect. Another one is that uh, projects want to eradicate fire and erosion. And I am not saying fire and erosion are good. I'm saying maybe we have to a little bit nuance these ideas. Another point is that they, they look at a very uh, local scale, whereas sometimes you need to look at a broader scale where things happen. Um, so, uh, for example, people are moving all the time, and uh, people make decisions about which kind of land they cultivate. They can move to the forest, but they can also move to other areas which are going to be attractive for other reasons, like infrastructure, school for the kids. And you have people moving to center, urban center, even if there is no good land, and they can cultivate in savanna if they have the means to do that. So that broad scale also has to be looked at. And, Fourth point is that farmers are not trusted as rational economic agents. Uh, so every time the project has a failure, it always considers it's because the, the, the farmers are not well educated enough, they need to be sensitized, etc. Instead of wondering that maybe it's the technology proposed that's the pro by the project that's not good and should be questioned. And then it, it summarizes a little bit all those things, but uh, politics and reductionist science, you know, favor reification and discourage reflexivity. Well, what does that mean? I think I keep that for the discussion because I think I'm a little bit late. And um, so uh, the, the last slide is about, you know, is like a conclusion. So... Um, <laughs> this is awkward, isn't it? <laughs> so... There's a need to support a broader range of options, to leave farmers to choose among these options, to value the, the women's labor also and their participation, and maybe to create incentive or, or instead of always having just a plan, uh, stop demon demonization and romanticization of nature and cease beyond science and data sets and also think about our common sense, our experience of the reality and not just the data we can extract from, from it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Jacques. I, I appreciate you, you being the, the first person to be part of this draconian effort to stop things, right? At the, at, it's kind of the Academy Awards, you know, when people come up behind you. And if I can have music playing next time, that'd be really uh, <laughs> useful. But thank you. That was a really great start. And now I want to jump to... Um, we really need to show the last slide because it's the disclaimer that we need to do for history. Oh. Just show it just for one second. <laughs>
slide disclaimer for legal reasons. People in TV land, this is important. Okay, this is a dis disclaimer. There we go. Okay. Okay. Nice. Thank you. Thank you. And, and of course, you can go back to your Questions? slides when we're communicating. Yeah? Mm. Okay. Fantastic. Okay, this is working out really well. Questions? Okay. Um, so now I'm going to introduce to you. Um, Questions first? Pardon me. Questions first in between and then questions after. Pardon me. We have two minutes for questions. I have a quick question. Could you address a little bit why the multi year use of the same plots would suddenly introduce weeds as opposed to the first year why weeds aren't present in that okay. so setup? When you cultivate, you know, in the forest, if you go to a forest, you will see nothing, especially if it is a primary forest, nothing is going on the ground. Huh? Uh, because under the shade of the trees, the weeds are not growing. So if you clear the forest, you don't have any seeds, any weed seed, because there were no grasses growing in the forest. So you plant your seeds, and no other seed is going to germinate. You, only your crop is growing. But now, of course, the seeds, you know, they can be brought by the wind or by the animals or by, by whatever people walking. So little by little, they come and they can multiply very fast. So you stay a longer time, you have more weeds coming. OK, one question over here. Uh, could you be a little bit more specific about who exactly, in this case, were the, the red actors? Um, who were coming in with this, uh, with the set of assumptions that you listed for us? Were they Congolese? Who were the actual actors in this case? So at the moment, there's no red project, but there's the idea of preparing the ground to make red project being implemented later on, because uh, there's a large, you know, uh, very important red policy in, in Congo. Um, so there's a, a national committee, a red national committee, which is. Um, preparing the country for red, which is supporting a number of national projects, which are pilot projects. There are actually six, plus three private projects. But uh, there is one of those, I mean, the, pri the one private red project in the other sites, which I did not present. But in this place, at the moment, there's no red projects. Um, but uh, the approach reflects a little bit uh, what other projects what Red Project are doing. For example, uh, I didn't mention that here, but they are making a zoning of the area uh, in order to define an area dedicated to agriculture and an area dedicated to conservation. So when there will be a Red Project, this conservation area will be the area which will justify carbon credits. Um, so it's more like a preparedness. And I have to say also that, um, you know, um, the comment I made on those on those, uh, on those systems, you know, um, are absolutely not comments about, you know, the work of an organization. Because uh, it's really, um, it's the whole logic that determines the fact that farmers are proposed those technologies that might be not the, not the best uh, adaptation. Huh? Uh, it's because, you know, uh, it has to be no burning the vegetation because there is red behind. Uh, and I, I really I discussed with the, 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 the staff from the project, they are totally aware of those, uh, of those issues, but you know, they are in the system, they have to play with that system. So just to say you know, that I don't want to blame any organization, any people working in those places who are all doing a very difficult job, uh, but uh, the, even if there is no red project yet, there is a red spirit, a red logic, and that spirit means don't use fire, don't clear any forest, and then that means, you know, transform radically your system in a way that's actually uh, quite unrealistic. Right. Okay. Um, I, I think that, is the time up for Q&A? Yeah. Okay, so we're gonna come back to Q&A a lot at the end when all three panels have finished speaking. So we'll have time for that um, in a few minutes, okay? So thank you very much, yeah. Jacques. Um, you can clap again. <laughs> and, uh, this, this, this nicely speaks to the often perverse impacts we have when we introduce broad scale instruments without thinking about the very important on the ground consequences. And we're grateful to Jacques uh, for this. And now I'm going to introduce uh, Karine, is that okay? Okay, Karine Keschel, who is a biologist by training, has a master's degree in environmental science from the University of Sao Paulo, 
and is currently pursuing an MPA at the School of International and Public Affairs at uh, Columbia University. Uh, she has worked for six years at a leading environmental NGO in the Brazilian Amazon Forest Agricultural uh, Frontier and uh, as the Deputy Executive Coordinator at the Institu Instituto Centro de Vida, her work addressed a combination of environmental issues, management strategies, initiatives to influence public policy, and corporate uh, social responsibility. Uh, so with that, we're, uh, join me in welcoming Karine, who will speak um, on the topic, balancing large-scale soybean expansion with smallholders agriculture lessons from the Brazilian forest agricultural frontier. Thank you. Yeah. Up, like that, that's better. So good morning everyone, my name is Karin, uh, I'm really happy to be here. So I'm gonna uh, talk a little bit about some lessons learned from the Brazilian forest agricultural frontier. So the agenda of the presentation, I'm gonna talk about the Amazon, some historical drivers of deforestation, some initiatives from the soy supply chain, and some pol public policies to smallholders in the Amazon and future challenges. So first of all, when we think about the Amazon, we have to think about three different uh, concepts. First is the Amazon biome, that's the green line. Then we have the Amazon watershed, that's the blue line. And there is a legal concept that's called the legal Amazon, that's a political boundary, that's the shaded area on that, on that map. So when we think about the Brazilian Amazon, uh, we have a population of 21 million inhabitants. It represents 6% of the Brazilian GDP. Total area is 5 million square kilometers. This is half of the size of the United States. We have 24% uh, of protected areas, 21% of indigenous land, and 12% of small land owners. So in the map, the green areas are the protected areas and the orange, yellowish areas are the indigenous land. So when we think about the Amazon, we have to think about deforestation as well. Uh, nowadays, almost 20% of the forest is already cleared. This area is, more, is bigger than the state of Texas, so it's a pretty huge area. And, but at the same time, we know that deforestation rates has been reducing over the time. And this is due to a lot of facts. First, we can mention some public policies in Brazil. Uh, fiscalization has increased. Technology are, is uh, much better to control and to monitor the deforestation. And we can think about economic crisis of the prices com of the commodities. We can think also at some initiatives from the private sector. And yeah, this all, this all combined uh, lead to a decrease of deforestation rates. However, degradation has been increasing a lot recently. This is due to illegal timber extraction. Um, so, when we think about historical drivers of deforestation in Brazil, uh, in the Amazon, we have to think about cattle ranching. 80% of the area that is already cleared has pasture on it, and the average is one cow per hectare, so it's a very low intensive production. But other stakeholders like smallholders are important and timber extraction as well. And we think about agricultural, we have to think about soy. Soy has played an important role. It's not very important right now, but historically it is important. Nowadays we have around 9 million of hectares of soy being planted in Brazil, in the Amazon. And this represents 8% of the, so of the total soy that is produced in the world. So it's very significant. Most of this soy goes to Europe, but also for Asia, especially India and China. And this soy is used mostly for feed the animals, uh, like cow and chicken and pigs. But it's also used for food and fuel. All of this uh, agricultural expansion leads to some social and environmental uh, problems. We can mention some uh, health effects due to pesticides or deforestation, carbon emission, loss of biodiversity, but also problems with uh, indigenous people or traditional communities. 
To deal with all of these problems, uh, the soy supply chain has launched in 2004 an initiative, an international uh, multi-stakeholder initiative that's called the Roundtable on Responsible Soy. These, uh, at this initiative, we have uh, NGOs, we have traders, we have uh, chemical industries, and we have at some point some governments, and the producers, they are all sit together. And since 2007, they have uh, develop um, a standard or certification that address all of these challenges. So legal, uh, responsible labor conditions, community relations, environmental responsibility, and good agricultural practice. And nowadays we have uh, already one million tons of soy that is already certified. And the Dutch government made a commitment that after 2006, they're going to buy only RTRS soy, or only responsible soy, or more restrict than this. So uh, it's already one step. It's not the solution, but it's a, a good solution. So regarding Brazil, we have another initiative that's called the Soy Moratorium that uh, was launched in 2006. And all the traders made a commitment not to buy soy that was planted in, uh, in the Amazon or in recent deforestation area after 2006. So last year, less than 1% of the Amazon was planted with soy. So we can see that uh, this is a very um, successful initiative as well. So and when, what about the smallholders? When we think about smallholders in the Amazon, we have rural settlements more than 2,000, and this is 77 million hectares. We have seven, more than 700,000 families living there, but at the same time, they are responsible for one-third of deforestation in Brazil, and, but at the same time, they are very important for food production in Brazil. So why are they important? Because if we do not have some policies or some ways to keep those smallholders on their land, they're going to lease those lands to uh, big landowners for soy producers or cattle ranchers. This will lead to a situation of food insecurity for them, but also for the population who lives in the area. And this can cause some social problems in the city. And so that's a very crucial stakeholder that we need to address. And to address all these challenges, the Brazil government has launched a program that's called the Zero Hunger Program. And for instance, school lunch, at least 30% of the school lunch must come from smallholders in the region or in the surrounding. This is a, so we are bringing access to market for them. Uh, there is another program that's called Food Ac Acquisition Program. So the Brazilian government buy the production, so we are uh, providing access to markets for those smallholders. And we have a credit that's PRONAF, National Program for Strengthening Family Agriculture. That's a credit line that allows smallholders to get this credit and to invest in their land. But most of these investments are done in cattle ranching and not in agriculture. So we need to provide them some technical assistance to, technical assistance to be able to convince them to produce some food. So future challenge. So we know that there is an increase in demand of Asian markets, especially for soy. And this soy is going to expand in some place. It can happen in the Amazon, or it can happen in, in the savanna, what is going on right now in Brazil. All the expansion has been in other biomes. So how, we do, how do we deal with this conversion of native vegetation? Uh, uh, we have an issue, like all of this region of the Amazon is considered like the bread basket of the world, but at the same point, we import food there. I used to live in the state of Mato Grosso, and all of the food that was eaten there was brought from other states of Brazil. So what is the point of producing food for the world and not being able to produce our own food? And regarding smallholders, as I told, we have to keep or we have to maintain those, pop, those stakeholders on their land so they can be able to produce food for them and for, uh, for Brazilian population in general. But for this, they need technical assistance and we need access to market. And we can think about some um, public-private par partnerships to access them to market as well. And another big issue that is coming in the Amazon right now is oil, uh, dams, mining, and reduction of protected areas. These will impact not only smallholders, but these will 
can lead to more deforestation and at some point can affect uh, the production of commodities as well. So in conclusion, I would say that there is no silver bullet to address the issue of reducing deforestation and to provide food security, but it's crucial that we have to think that this area is not an empty space, it's not only uh, a forest, we have a lot of people there, we have to, to make, uh, to bring some solutions for, especially for the smallholders regarding food security issues. We have uh, some public policies to, to, to address these challenges, but at the same time we have, I think the private sector can play a very important role um, on addressing those issues. And as civil society, we, we can ask those companies to be more responsible on their production and um, yeah, on their commercialization. So thank you for your time, on time, and I'm happy to take any questions. No, we have to play, excellent job. So, thank you very much. We have time for a couple of questions. We're doing two minutes now, and then we'll have a lot more after. Okay. Any questions? Busy here, or? Sure. Um, maybe yeah, over here. I'm, you may have said this, but I'm interested in what stimulated the formation of the roundtable on responsible soy production. Was that from the private sector? And if so, what was the stimulus for actually getting organized and doing something different? Actually, that was a NGO-led initiative. So that was a period that was a lot of roundtables starting. But the private sector reacted pretty well, and they really engaged themselves on this. And we have all the traders there, and we have all the, the industries there. And because they really needed to address the issue of deforestation or environmental bad practice or labor conditions. So they needed to make their image better. And I would say that it took a while for us to really get them engaged, so they were just dialoguing, 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 and just postponing the commitment. But since, I don't know, almost eight years, we have some pretty good commitments, and right now we need to, to enhance those, uh, those commitments from the private sector. But I think, I believe in, in this platform, so I think we can increase the responsible soil production. Thank you, right. Jessie here. Um, two quick questions. First is, uh, talk about the round table again, if you think that somebody should be there and it's not currently participating, participating in the round table. And I don't know if it's a question for an hour or later, but uh, you touch a lot of issues that we were talking about before. One of the main issues when we talk about any kind of production in the Amazon is land tenure. So if you could touch this at some point now or later. Okay, the land tenure one is a tricky one. So Brazil has a very instable or um, doesn't have very clear rules, rules on uh, land tenure. But there are some, for instance, uh, nowadays to monitor deforestation right now or to register the property, they are not asking for land tenure titles. Only if you, as long as you are there and you are producing, you can register your property. So this can be monitored, this is a very good progressive uh, public policies that some government has um, has, uh, has taken. I think Jeff mentioned this yesterday when he, when he talked to us about the, the forest code. And regarding small holders, they doesn't have the land property. They, they receive the land and only after 10 years, if they are in this land, they receive uh, the land title. I believe that they should receive the land title right now because they are responsible for what they are doing on their land. But this is a huge and very complicated issue in Brazil. And when we think about the round table, I think uh, that was a multi-stakeholder international round table, but now we have to bring to the table the governments. I think if the Brazilian government could be involved in the round table, maybe this could be a little bit more uh, strengthened. Okay, thank you very much. Um, and we'll come back to these okay. questions um, uh, in detail at the break, but we got a very good idea about how in this presentation a number of different problems and initiatives are interacting to potentially produce some important uh, results. So thank you very much, Karim. And now I want to turn to um, Nepal and Dr. Jagannath Adhikari, who has carried out a, a great deal of research on natural resources management encompassing themes like agricultural development, uh, land reform, 
and management, uh, participatory forest management, uh, biodiversity, urban environment, and climate change, and uh, food security. Uh, his focus is on South Asia, especially uh, Nepal, and has written and edited a number of books um, and articles on these, these topics. I think uh, his talk promises to be very um, uh, fascinating because of the potential he's going to look at at uh, the ability of thinking of forests as edible forests and addressing some of the problems. And his title is Edible Forest, Rethinking Nepal's Forest Governance in the Era of Food uh, Insecurity. So join me in welcoming um, Jagannath. Thank you. Well, thank you so much uh, for your kind introduction. Uh, I'm very honored to be here uh, to present my presentation, as well as to interact with the students and faculty members. Uh, I learned a lot uh, in this process. <clears throat> uh, we all know that uh, Nepal's uh, forest policies have changed a lot uh, in the last, uh, say, 50 years. So originally, uh, it's a kind of um, uh, people-managed uh, forestry uh, before the modernization of the uh, state. And then as the state was modernized, it was a kind of a very centralized forest management, uh, which didn't work in most of the cases. And then uh, the policymaker again realized that we need to have people's participation in forest management, uh, especially in the context of Nepal, uh, uh, because of the biophysical condition, as well as the nature of the economy, uh, that called for the participatory forestry, uh, which we uh, know uh, by the name of <coughs> uh, community forestry. Uh, which is quite extensive and which is uh, relatively uh, successful in a sense. <coughs> uh, but uh, we have new challenges also at the same time. These challenges are uh, like uh, food insecurity is growing <coughs> and also challenges come from the uh, growing uh, landlessness. There's a kind of conflict between, uh, uh, I mean, uh, conflict between landlessness, uh, landless people, versus uh, forestry. And uh, if, we, if you look into the newspapers, new, newspapers of Nepal, you'll see uh, almost every day that there has been conflicts somewhere uh, in the forest. Uh, peoples uh, wanting to occupy land for settlement uh, or for the agricultural land. <coughs> so this is the context in which I said that we have to convert uh, at least the community forestry into uh, edible forest. <coughs> So the, and, uh, we need uh, a new style of governance for that. Uh, that is the main uh, point. <coughs> uh, I mean, it's not a single research I'm going to tell about. It's my own personal experience, <coughs> as well as I draw uh, various points from my uh, various research. So it's kind of uh, pulling together. <coughs> This thing like that? Yeah, yeah, that button there. Okay. Then press this one. Yeah. Well, it's, uh, just to give you a context, just to give you a context, uh, this is the region uh, where I, I was born, studied, and nowadays I do research. So this is my kind of uh, uh, area where and I focus here. So looking back, I know that these are the, uh, these are the forest products we used to derive when we were kids from the forest. So from the high mountain, we used to have all these uh, vegetables uh, up two slides, and they are now sold in the market. Uh, so it's a kind of a link. Uh, uh, so people are selling in the market. And then there is, uh, in the third one, it's uh, wild honey. It's very popular there. Uh, there is a film, uh, Honey Hunting in Nepal. If you go to YouTube, uh, you can uh, get the information about it. Uh, so, and I used to bring uh, such honey when I used to go to that place. <coughs> and there are so many uh, types of vegetables, fruits. Uh, some are consumed within the village and some are sold in the market. So it's a kind of a forestry used uh, uh, not only for timber, fuel wood, uh, and fodder, but also for the food. So this is the context. <coughs> So, I mean, based on that, we can develop a kind of a framework uh, which links 
forestry and food security. So there were different components. I, I think it was discussed in the, uh, in the first session, in the keynote address, uh, and also yesterday. That there are so many components of food security, uh, and uh, forest uh, is directly, as well as indirectly linked to different components of the uh, food security. Uh, and if we have uh, good institutions, uh, then it can lead to better food security. So uh, this is the thing. <coughs> Uh, so the recent concern is like there is a growing food crisis. Uh, there is quite uh, it's very evident, and there are many research showing this. And there is growing landlessness, and there is conflict in uh, resource use, uh, and there is still deforestation. Uh, and there is a uh, I mean in policy circle there was a debate about uh, whether it is uh, forest or farm, uh, or whether we should go uh, for forest as well as farm together. And, uh, <clears throat> and then there is declining biodiversity. And Nepal is one of the hottest spots is, uh, affected by climate change. And Himalayas are, uh, are facing uh, the highest uh, rise in temperature as compared to other regions. Uh, uh, but despite, that, uh, despite the, the linkage between forestry and food security that I have shown before, uh, there are still institutional barriers to link uh, forest and food security. So I'm more concerned with these uh, barriers now. So uh, landlessness situation, I mean, it's a country of small landholders. The average land holding is 0 0.7 hectare for a family. It's not for an individual. For a family, uh, 0 0.7 and then uh, hectare. And then there were about 25% uh, households living in rural areas which are more or less functionally landless. So, so, so they need uh, some kind of access to food. Uh, uh, I mean, food can be obtained through different ways, but forest can be a source uh, for, for food. So it's a uh, smallholder farming in Nepal, and there's not much scope for expanding agricultural land because of the geo uh, geological condition, and deforestation is still growing. Uh, and forest encroachment is still one of the uh, consequences of uh, landlessness. Uh, edible forest, which I mean giving food production emphasis in community-based forest management, that's what I mean by edible forest, can help to supplement. I don't mean it will completely fulfill the uh, food security requirement. Uh, we need uh, food production uh, in the agricultural land, but it can uh, supplement. <coughs> uh, in the, in far, so. So it's not a kind of, uh, we can, uh, there is still scope for increasing intensity of cropping in the agricultural land. Uh, that is there, that's one opportunity. But at the same time, we can also increase uh, food security through uh, edible forest. And, but there, as I said before, there are institutional barriers for this. So this, I mean, there are so many. <clears throat> uh, uh, there is some historical roots, uh, how the forest bureaucracy is established and why it doesn't give uh, much emphasis on food. Uh, because forest bureaucracy uh, was more concerned only with timber. Tim it was a timber-focused uh, uh, forest management. And, <clears throat> and there's institutional barriers uh, just to link. I think we discussed yesterday also, agriculture is one uh, vertical organization, forestry is another. There's no communication between them. Uh, that's another problem. <clears throat> and, a forest organization, they do not look into forest. They say it's not a uh, chapter. It belongs to another one. Uh, looking into various policies and forest acts, uh, they also constrain growing food and fodder crops uh, in community managed forest. <clears throat> uh, so there are problems uh, in, uh, uh, in terms of uh, raising livestock as well as getting food. Uh, and community forests still have timber and biodiversity as their main goal. So these are the, some of the uh, uh, barriers. So how to, how to address some of the barriers? I'll just uh, focus on the governance issue. I mean, making a community forest as edible forest also means it's a, a new land use policy. <clears throat> uh, and uh, in many cases, uh, such type of uh, Land use policy have worked within Nepal uh, because I've got some uh, experiences. And then, uh, and then various policies are needed 
that helps people to uh, produce food. Uh, and we also have to uh, think about red plus. Uh, if we restrict forest uh, use, then uh, I think there are questions about red plus. And then <clears throat> uh, there are a few experiments with certification, especially in the use of NTFEs, like medicinal hops that comes from forest. Uh, and the experience shows that um, there are some positive uh, things it can help. Uh, and, um, uh, and as a, the most important in this would be like uh, equity, uh, participation, sharing of the benefits, uh, and development of the uh, user committees, uh, which looks into um, uh, these aspects. Uh, if this happens, there is a kind of a cooperation from all the people, and then it can be managed well. So these are the new uh, governance ideas. Uh, but we need to, uh, we are thinking of kind of experimenting some community forest as uh, edible forest. And, uh, and in future, we'll see uh, how it goes. Yeah, with this, I end. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, again, uh, two minutes for questions right now, and then we'll open it up. So. Questions? Thank, thanks for your talk. Um, I wondered if you could just say a little bit more about um, the sorts of policies that are either being suggested or already implemented um, to to link uh, or to make forests more accessible to people in a food security perspective. I know you had a little bit of text under the under that second to last slide, but um, if you could say a little bit more about what's happening or what's proposed in that in that context. Uh, uh, you mean in terms of uh, uh, securing yeah, so, more food? So one of your um, Yep. Suggestions for improving governance uh, was to um, to create policies to allow people to uh, use and develop forests more or in a different way for, for food security. Yeah, I mean the thing is uh, now the, uh, the the forest act uh, doesn't permit people to grow food uh, except for one or two crops, um, and then uh, and that has some kind of um, uh, adverse impact on food security. So. If people are allowed to cultivate crops uh, without destroying much of the canopy, um, I mean, food production would increase. Uh, and, uh, and most of the, as you say uh, in the picture, there are women who cultivate it. There are poor people who, uh, who use it. So in that sense, it could be uh, helpful for food security. So, uh, so main thing is that. One more question. Uh, you mentioned briefly something about human rights issues related to forests. Can you s comment a little more on that? Uh, yeah, I mean, this uh, landlessness has become a very political thing. And because uh, if a landless household has a settlement in the forest, then, then uh, they will have a right to settle, a right to a shelter. Um, and then, uh, and that will lead to, uh, in my opinion, a very haphazard uh, uh, forest encroachment. Uh, and then uh, there are indigenous people who have been managing forest. Uh, I mean, in many places there are, uh, within Nepal, there are many indigenous people having. And they need, uh, uh, I mean, uh, we also signed this 169, ILO 169. That means we have to respect their uh, rights. And many of the foods are uh, culturally sensitive. They are required uh, during festival uh, in various things. And so if we give total rights for them to manage community forestry and produce food that is required for food security, and food security also includes producing food uh, required for the cultural purpose. So that would uh, help. Okay, one last question. Uh, thank you for your talk, Jagannath. Do you know of a region, um, or do you see regional variations in community forestry user groups uh, in their methods of, of maybe getting around or improvising strategies that, that bypass the Forest Act? Yeah, I mean, that's uh, quite interesting. Uh, you see, the indigenous um, uh, management pri prior to 
like Forest Act, prior to go, uh, government bureaucracy controlling all the forest, there was a variety of uh, management style. Local people had their own management style, and uh, the way they uh, used to pay the forest guard or rotate themselves to look after the forest. Uh, so there was uh, various norms. Uh, uh, even now, after the uh, Forest Act uh, 1993, which led to community forestry spread, um, there are some variations, uh, but it's not as uh, diverse as it, it was, because the regulation that is in the act, it has tried to uh, kind of uh, uh, homogenize uh, the style of management. Uh, but it's still, uh, there are very small scope uh, to, to go around the law. Uh, and in some cases, yes, people have done it. And the forester, government forester, uh, have turned the blind eye uh, to how people manage it. Okay, thank you very much. Um, uh, you can actually stay up here. While I'm talking, the other two speakers, please come up to the uh, table now. So we'll begin to have a uh, roundtable response to your questions. And um, before I open it up, I uh, want to say a couple of things, which is first that um, all of these speakers and their presentations really illustrate the point that would ever be trying to do at the global level with policy interventions to address these on-the-ground challenges. We better think very carefully about the local context and understand it very well, or we might design policies that have very perverse impacts on the problems we care about. Now, we all know that, but in reality, rarely do we actually redesign our international efforts to address these problems, and it's that link that is so important and that these papers and presentations nicely illustrate. Okay, I'm going to ask the first question to get us going. Now, the theme is we get to be provocative, okay, because we're in a university, so this is a chance to actually raise ideas, not just be conservative and, and uh, you know, not really changing things up. Okay? So I'm going to try and change things up a little bit okay? with the idea that this is a big seminar. Okay? It's not me talking, just an idea out there that I happen to be raising. Okay? So with that in mind, uh, this is the question I'm going to pose. Um, and behind the question is the concern, again, I raised before that, um, it just seems that for the last 20 years we have these great ideas, great instruments, great metaphors, and then they, they don't end up doing what we want. And so we redesign new metaphors and new ideas and go study them and find out that they're not quite doing what we want, and so we have new metaphors, and it's this vicious cycle, okay? So that's behind my question. So what I want to ask you, all three of you is to reflect on for a second. Um, Forgetting about anything now that's happening in terms of policy instruments right now. You've got to imagine now nothing's happening and you have a blank slate. Okay? And you're, you're king, okay, or queen, okay? What would you do to bring in policies that would be effective, really effective, right away, to address the problems that you've all talked about? Okay, what would you do? Forgetting about interests, coalitions, what would be most effective right now? Okay, and then how might we actually go about um, doing them? Okay, now I'm going to get even more provocative though. And I'm going to say, and how might you therefore design policies that would not have these unintended effects that you've all talked about? Okay, so let's just take, for example, the issue of uh, soya certification. Okay? Now, I work on forest certification, and I've also spoke recently at the Palm Oil Certification um, Congress. Okay, so here's a big issue, is that there's a strong concern that by focusing on practices of different industries, we might be inadvertently contributing towards deforestation. So the very sectors that end up deforesting forests, soya and palm, end up getting certified for being responsible in effect, arguably legitimizing the deforestation in the name of responsible <laughs> stewardship. Okay? Now, the solution to this problem, which people do recognize, is to say we have cut-off days, at which point your land could not be certified. Okay? So and it tends to coincide with the creation of the actual organization. So yes, the Forest Stewardship Council's cut-off day at which you can't certify um, for example, plantations, forest plantations, 
uh, that were converted from natural forests is 1993. Now, palm oil's cutoff day, in which you can't certify palm oil if they were converted from natural forests, is 2006. Hmm. And what's the cutoff day for soya? Trying to remember, but I believe it's 2008. 2000. I'm not sure. Okay, fine. So you can imagine this now. So if you're a company and you bought some land that is no longer natural forest but was, and it was converted after '93, you're out of luck for getting it forest certified. Ah, but you can go to soya or palm. Fantastic. Okay, so you do that. But now, if you're actually 2000 and let's say seven, you can't do palm. Ah, but you can do soya. So you do that, right? And so is this simply a game of actually rewarding some uh, types of degradation over others and not addressing ongoing problems of a deforestation, for example, okay? Um, now, I just pick on certification because I study it a lot, okay? And how do we address these questions of land use allocation versus practices, the actual practices? And is there an interaction between those that we want to think about? And finally, in the food security question, is the problem definition food security or is the problem definition local livelihoods and getting a chance to be part of the economic opportunities of a sort of local market? That's an important question because we can imagine that um, food security, if it means like actually protein and food for peoples, could be produced by large scale industrial farming quite efficiently and effectively. That might actually reduce pressures for deforestation that we learn is often impacted by local peoples. So what is the actual problem definition? Is it simply using food security as a way to achieve another problem, which is local peoples being involved in, in uh, management? So I'll stop there, but those are the examples that I want to raise and ask you then, given all this, what would you actually want to do if you could decide? Can I start? Yeah. So um, I really believe we don't need to clear any more forest to expand the production or to increase the production of food or commodity. For instance, in Brazil right now, we have around 20, uh, 200 million hectares of pasture, a uh, very low in intensity. Sometimes this is a degraded pasture. So when we think about uh, the Amazon that na have 9 million of hectares that produce 8% of the soil of the world, and we think about we have 200 million hectares of pasture, we really don't need to clear any more land. But the challenge is, how do we address uh, the food production or the commodity production to use those areas and not to go to a forest area? Because the forest area is cheaper than the area that is already open. It. So how do, what kind of policies we can use for this? And I think one instrument that could be, uh, could be interesting is the, the land use planning. But how, uh, what is a land use planning? It could be a ecological economic zoning, and we, we, have, we have to take in consideration like the limitations and uh, the suitability of the land. And we have to take in consideration uh, the, the stakeholders that are in this area. But we, we, if we can develop a very comprehensive uh, land use planning, we can really address the issue of food security uh, without converting any land anymore. But we have to need, uh, we, for this, we need uh, to have other types of public policies. Now, like, what kind of incentives to, to convince the producers to use this area that is already open it? Okay, um, thank you. Um, Jacques. So, provocative, huh? Yeah. Okay, yeah. so I will not care about the local context. Okay. Uh, in 10 minutes, it was too short to explain, but I will not care about the local context because there are one million local contexts of millions of people, or maybe thousands local contexts mm. of thousands of localities. Mm. So there's no way I can take care of the local context. If I want to take care of the local context, I will get it wrong. Because you cannot have, you know, uh, one PhD student in every village looking at every single, you know, local context. There's no way. So I will look at the big picture. And so the big picture is, you know, those things that apply basically everywhere you go. Actually, it's not so different even maybe in South America, in Asia, or in Africa. So what's the big picture? The big picture is, well, one thing, for example, well, if the forest doesn't provide any income, it's, it, if, it, if it is worth nothing, I don't mean intrinsically, I mean 
for the livelihood of the people or for the economy in general, well, it would just be gone. There's no reason people keep it. So let's put some value on the forest. Then maybe, you know, we'll, people will have an incentive to keep it. Rule number two, the forest is used. People make their livelihood out of it by doing shifting cultivation, going cassava. So that value I put on the forest has to go to those same people. If it goes to other people, then those who are using the forest, they will rebel, they will burn it, they will take revenge. So every place I have been on forest frontier, those two rules apply. So concretely, that, that means what? Well, then I will buy a service. I would say to those people, well, you sell cassava. What about selling a service which consists of keeping that piece of forest in place? And I pay you as much as you can get by you know, making cassava out of it. Now it's your choice. You don't want to do it, you, you do cassava. So as you have the choice, then I have to pay you enough. Uh, then we will see how much money I, I am ready to put on this forest, how much worth I consider if it is. It is. If I, I'm not ready to put as much money as you get from the cassava, then let's just forget it. That just means we, we don't care about the forest. We, you know. So for me, that's a market approach. That's a carbon market. But it's a market where you know, the, the, the players in the market are the same that are the, player, the players today who are those farmers doing shifting cultivation. But in the red currently, the players are changing. The players were the farmers. Now the players are, you know, a few uh, actors, you know, who can make the intermediary between, you know, the, the, the government and, you, and, uh, and some buyers around the world. Yeah, so I will buy. Uh, let's service. first go to Jagannath and then we can yeah. come back for you know, rebuttal. Okay. Well, I'll first go to your uh, concern about uh, food security definition yeah. and then come to others. Um, I mean, I personally mean by food security, uh, not only access, uh, utilization, uh, stability or vulnerability, but, but also the uh, farmer. I also uh, pay attention to the person who produce food right. um, and uh, the local livelihood, local environment. Uh, so so it's, I take it into a border context of food security. Right. And uh, considering this problem of uh, narrow uh, thinking about food security, uh, uh, there is a uh, growing attention in Nepal, uh, I'm sure it is in other countries also, to change it to uh, food sovereignty. So, 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 food sovereignty. Uh, sovereign, food sovereignty? Sovereignty, sorry. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, in fact, Nepal's uh, government policy is not only on food security, but food sovereignty. Right. So, if you read our constitution, uh, which has uh, environmental and food-related uh, points. So it says that 40% of the land cover should be forest, land area should be covered by forest. We should give emphasis on food sovereignty, not on food security, because of the influence of uh, bigger companies coming out. Right. Uh, but somehow Nepal is still uh, it's not influenced by big companies, the way I uh, see uh, others' uh, context, uh, partly because it's a small landlocked country uh, surrounded by India and China, uh, and so uh, very difficult transport. Transport, and some uh, some of my friends also give credit to the political conflict uh, that uh, the foreign <laughs> investor haven't come to come to Nepal for investing deforestation and other thing. Right. Uh, that is a kind of a, a blazing blessing in disguise that the conflict didn't permit all these big companies to come there uh, and other thing. Uh, and then on this issue of, I mean, what I, uh, I mean, I give uh, due consideration to uh, local context. Right. I do, yeah. uh, as opposed to you. <coughs> <laughs> <laughs> because uh, what we have seen is giving consideration to local context, decentralization uh, in terms of forest management, it has worked well. Right. Because committed forestry worked well. Right. Centralized forestry, government managed forests didn't work well. And so we uh, came back to this. And g giving a lot of uh, empowerment to local people uh, means that uh, they know the local context. Right. They know the local food. They know the local genotype. Right. Uh, they have knowledge about the ecosystem. So it gives the chance for them to manage their ecosystem, mm -hmm. whether forest or land or pasture or other thing, uh, to secure their livelihood. Because livelihood is a prime concern. 
if the ecosystem doesn't uh, fulfill their livelihood, they won't manage it. That's for sure. Right. Okay. Thank you. Karin, did you have a... Yeah, it's a very quick comment. It's like, uh, when we take in consideration smallholders in Brazil, and if you want to pay them, for instance, to protect the forest, but we have to compete with the opportunity cost of soybean, or they are leasing their lands for soybean, it's impossible. There is no money to conserve the amount of forest that we have and to compete with uh, the opportunity cost of soybean. So how do we, how do you think to tackle this? <laughs> uh, or maybe if you want just to. I actually do. I can't wait, but I, do, I want Jacques to respond to first. Yeah. So I guess uh, opportunity cost it has to be considered within the policy frame, which has to be broader than what happens just on that locality. So, I mean, if you consider opportunity cost is, uh, you know, uh, how much you, lo you lose by not growing soybean in that place, and soybean is going to result in thousands of, uh, et cetera, of dollars per hectare, or I don't know how much, but a lot of money. Okay, well, then, of course, you cannot match that. Mm -hmm. But maybe there are other places where you can grow soybean. So if you look at, at the economy at the national scale and not only the business plan of that farmer, then opportunity cost might be the difference uh, between growing soybean in a place which is not a forest place, but which is maybe uh, uh, some land which is not really intensively cultivated or that some landlord is uh, uh, neglecting a little bit. So shifting the production from the forest to those places uh, results in a lower opportunity cost than the one you would calculate just based on the business plan of that farmer. Now, how to get that farmer who wanted to invest there? I agree, it's, it's, it's not easy, tricky, it's complicated. Yeah. And, and, and I, I think also that uh, with the opportunity cost approach, that also means that uh, you cannot stop deforestation everywhere and that the uh, state also has some legitimacy to, to do what others have done before. Uh, in Europe, we finished to clear our forest uh, in the Middle Age, and in America, maybe 200 years ago, and all those countries covered by huge, huge track of forest, they want to have also part of this, be part of the same history. So that means that in places where the opportunity cost is super high, maybe that means also those places, okay, let's do agriculture there, but try to do it in a nice way, or at least keeping you know, some, some protected area to keep some pieces of those ecosystems. I just want to make an observation and we'll open it up for broader questions. So I really enjoyed uh, your responses. And there really are a couple of themes that came out that are also very much in the broader literature on these questions. And so one is the policy instrument. And so we've heard um, land use is key, which is, which is often seen as sort of a, a top-down central government approach. We've heard about local land use, governance being uh, the key, and we've heard about sort of market mechanisms and incentives being something to think about. Um, but then we thought about actual problems. We've heard different problems from deforestation to livelihoods, etc. cetera. Um, and to me, the big challenge is one, linking the instruments to the problems we care about. So right now I would argue that the tail is wagging the dog, okay, which means that we really focus now on incentive-based approaches, red, soya, uh, certification, forest certification, and so on, and often are not achieving the results we want because we end up believing in the instrument and not the actual problem. And that has to get reversed. Okay? And it's a big problem now because we assume these things are the way to go. Markets are good. Businesses are good. They could be good, but we must, must be more careful linking to the actual results we care about. And I would argue, therefore, that the big problem uh, that we have on forest governance, including the questions you're talking about, is the need to distinguish whether we're talking about some kind of practice, be it local livelihoods, be it palmel certification, and then designation of the broader landscape according to different practices. Because the reality is that markets, be they rubber or soya, will, will determine the actual use unless we do have some kind of top-down approach for allocating these things. The challenge is then, well, what about local governance? And I would argue the problem is that it's not a simple dichotomy of central versus local. So, for example, where we do see successful, and by that I mean broad support, I don't necessarily mean the best, examples of broad land use allocations, New Zealand, uh, British Columbia, and so on, have been where the government, the national or provincial government said, 
here is what you must do. You must protect 12% of the land base from extraction. You must do these things. But then you local peoples decide how to do it. And if you don't do, get an agreement, we will then impose it on you. This is an amazing technique. So it's in between a central and local. And the local peoples, from the mining sector to forest sector to First Nations, realize they now have a self-interest in actually agreeing to broader strategies because if not, there's a worry of getting a worse outcome by the, being imposed. And then the solution is quite legitimate and it's widely supported. From there, you can discuss practices and how to be better stewards. But my concern is we're focusing on the practices and, and forgetting about the broader questions of allocation of resources. And that leads to the question, is Brazil's Amazon's 25% uh, protected area enough? Maybe it is enough. Maybe we say that actually is pretty good. And the question is, how do we maintain that? Or do we say, no, it's the Amazon, it should be half. And then how do we have that kind of conversation? Um, yeah. Yeah, for, for this focus on, on the instruments, I, I was amazed. I was, um, you know, at a climate party um, a few weeks ago in Washington. And, uh, you know, there was a lot of people involved in climate policies and having done an international career. And, and you, then, you know, you go around, you have some snacks, a drink, and you chat with people. And what really struck me is that the local was absent. Well, everybody was talking about very sophisticated instruments. Everybody was very smart, very brilliant people, young people committed. But the local was absent. So you might think I'm contradicting myself because I said I don't care about the local. No. It's a seminar you're allowed to. <laughs> no, no, I, I think I don't. I mean, the problem is that the local is ignored, but even for its basics. Because the local, there are some commonalities in the local. There are stuff that any place you go, any local place you go, is just the same. For example, uh, I mentioned yield. Does yield matter? In shifting cultivation around the world, yield is not the main criteria for the farmers. So that's something local, but it's not contextual, it's really general. So these kind of things are neglected, and then we focus on the instrument, and the instrument doesn't deliver. Yeah. I have a very quick uh, comment about um, the definition, what is enough or not, yeah. because we don't have all these answers. And if we have to think right now, we will say that's too late. So yeah. Yeah. that's a discussion that we, I was having with Janus the other day. So we cannot give us this, um, we cannot allow ourselves to think that we still can keep deforestating right. or clearing some land. So I don't know, it's just a, Maybe half of the Amazon is sufficient. I don't know, maybe not. I think we are. But my point is we should have an idea as to what we actually want to achieve before we start having instruments being chosen. I mean, Tasmania uh, has 46% of its uh, land base in protected areas, 46 or 7%, uh, which is very high. But it's also until recently been deforesting, okay, to plantations for pulp mills. So depending on your problem definition, this is a really great story or a really bad story. And if you decide beforehand about these land use allocation systems, you've got some kind of context to make that choice versus simply grabbing onto the latest instrument and not really knowing where you're going. Yeah. Okay, now we should, uh, we should open I it up though now. Oh, sorry. Can I say one, one or two words? I think I uh, fully agree. Even though we don't know much about it, the best practices, uh, I mean, among the practices, uh, and from their impacts, uh, and when we consider best practices. So that shows that um, uh, a, broader, a very broad uh, goal is important uh, in terms of uh, uh, what we want. Uh, and that has to be fixed not by top-down approach, but by communication between local and central, or whatever it is. That has to be a communication. Uh, otherwise, uh, you see the the local context and local people would not agree on what has been imposed upon. So that could be uh, 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 that could backfire yeah. the policy. <clears throat> uh, and in uh, in South Asia, I think in some in some sense they have started doing this. Like in Nepal, we want 40% of the uh, land area forest it's written in the constitution. Right. Uh, Bhutan, it is written in the constitution that 60% uh, of the land area of the country should be the forest. Okay. Uh, these are broad goals, and based on the scientists and people that have uh, done it. 
um, and uh, and broad categories of uh, land use is, is important. And we are realizing in Nepal, we are realizing that we don't have uh, land use categories for the agricultural land. We have to build road and we have to build settlement and things like that. So uh, very best uh, agricultural land have been destroyed because of this. Kathmandu is a most fertile uh, land in the, I, I must say, in the world because it was a kind of a lake for many, many years. And so the soil, I mean, farmers used to dig soil down to get the fertile soil up. So that was a practice, but it has all been uh, uh, settled fully. Uh, and then all this uh, land hasn't been used properly. Right. And now people feel that uh, we should have a kind of a broad categories of land where to build uh, settlement, where to build road, and where to build factories. Uh, yeah, that's the thing. Okay, and, and that's for you a good approach? Pardon? Is that a good idea? Yeah, yeah, yeah. that should be, that's good. Okay. Uh, in, in, in forestry and uh, protected areas, uh, broad categories have been made. Yeah. I know that. Okay. Because uh, we had national park, and uh, we had uh, people right. living nearby. Yeah. And then we felt that uh, one more category is needed where people can, uh, can use the uh, natural resources like forest. And so they, they develop a buffer zone in between. Yeah, okay. So buffer zone, people can depend on buffer zone, but protect the uh, national park. Okay. So, so nowadays there is buffer zone in every national park. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So it, I think it's, it should help. It's happening. Okay, great. Now we're going to open it up now for questions, okay? Over here. Panelists move their microphones a little closer so they're speaking a little bit more. Oh, and this one isn't on. Is it on? No. Mine's not on. Hi. Um, thanks for um, this discussion. It's been really interesting. So we've been talking a lot at this conference about integrating um, agriculture and food systems with forests um, and I'm wondering a lot of these systems by their nature are diverse and kind of hard to measure or quantify and so I'm wondering if you can comment on how to make these multi-use areas more legible to whether it's market incentives, certification, red planning or um, like a top-down landscape allocation approaches and whether like the diversity of these systems makes that more difficult and how you would kind of deal with that. Okay, so local people, they combine those things. That's clear. I mean, uh, shifting cultivation is really, it's a forest agricultural system. As soon as you leave the land, the forest regrows. Uh, people mix, you know, picking up products. I mean, what we call non-timber forest products are quite often uh, harvested in, in fields or in fallow, so it's really a combination. Now, we have some policies. Uh, there are some um, outcome from those systems, some services. We want those services to be provided because at global scale, we consider that this has some value and maybe uh, at global scale, we recognize more value than we look at people recognize for some features or some services of those systems. So then we can pull some strings. We can play a little bit with the system, and uh, that's when we do in any policy when we put taxes or incentives. So when something you know is good for the for the community but uh, not good for the individual then we put a subsidy so it becomes better for the individual and then the community will benefit, otherwise the individual will not do it. For example, we want more, less forest to be cleared, then we put some value on the forest. Red, we can call that a subsidy. It's market-based approach, but we could also call that a subsidy. We just don't use the word because if you put subsidy you know, in, a, in a grant application or in a policy documents, people will bar in red. You, know, you, you must not use that word. But uh, it's a subsidy, actually. Um, and, um, and then people are going to react to that. So uh, yeah, to, to clarify something, when I said that I don't care about the local context, that doesn't mean that the local context doesn't matter. It matters a lot 
But that's precisely because it matters that I don't care about it. Because I leave it to the people. They know their local context very well. So this is actually what you were suggesting, you know, you, you, what you were mentioning about uh, Brazil. You, you create an incentive and then people are going to find their own solution and so they will appropriate. They will find the right way to intensify the system, keeping more forest because there will be the incentive of the payment coming from the subsidy or from the carbon market. Um, yeah, let's take a few more questions so we can uh, get some um, input here, back over here, and then over here. Um. I, oh, I actually yeah. wanted to add to that because uh, oh. it is on, but it's on. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay. <laughs> I actually wanted to uh, address that question because um, when I work, was working at the World Agroforestry Center, um, we, I was trying to think of the, the dilemma of certification being only for one product, but yet you want to protect a whole landscape. Yeah. So how do you do that? Um, one model that we looked at was Appalachian, which does focus on one product, but it also focuses on the whole terroir, and it focuses on the savoir faire of the producers, so there is a whole sort of cultural dimension of Appalachian. So could you take that principle and apply it more generally? And so I came up with this idea of high value agroforestry zones that would produce a number of products that could receive some kind of sort of landscape certification that would take the savoir faire, the cultural element, into, into account that would, that is the local, that I think is absolutely critical, you know, for maintaining uh, the goods and services, the diverse amount, number of goods and services on a landscape. So I, nothing ever came of that concept note, but if anybody's interested in pursuing that, that, that line, I, I'd be interested in discussing it. Mm -hmm. Can you make yeah. a comment on? Thank you. Okay, um, let's just take two more questions okay. and then you can okay. respond, okay? So just hold your responses. Um, yeah. yeah, here and then over here. Yes. Um, I think the problem about deforestation is when talking about deforestation, we should also consider the context of leakages. And um, the leakages can be national or local, but can also be international. You may reduce deforestation in Brazil because you don't need people to cut forest again, but if in Peru they, there is no that same system, so you, you are increasing deforestation in Peru. So how do, we, um, how do you think we can address the leakages problem in local, national, or international context? Yeah, yeah thank you. Okay, and then one last question here and then we'll have responses. One, if we're talking about glo global or larger frameworks versus local solutions, and you're talking, I mean, I, I find your comments on instrument and the pushing of the instrument and the priority of the instrument very interesting. Um, in, if it's about language and it's about interpretation of local systems into larger languages and translation to and from, if instruments such as ecosystem services are created on an institutional scale, um, there's a corollary to that in current forms of rethinking economic policy and economics where there's a focus on local currency. Is there an opportunity for something like a local framework for ecosystem services? And is it important to create a global currency? Or is it more important to have a local currency where there's maybe less velocity in the system overall, but more opportunities for translation and more languages at, at work? Okay, thank you. Um, my comment is about um, the, the issue that you brought us. Um, what is going on in Brazil right now? It's a new uh, initiative, what they call the jurisdictional certification or a zero jurisdictional zero deforestation. So instead of just looking for soy or just looking for uh, soy certification or timber certification, how we can get a compromise from the whole municipality, or it can be a basin, or it could be a, a region, or even a region. So we get the commitment of all stakeholders, and uh, for a zero deforestation, or we take the whole area as a, I don't know, um, 
very hazardous chemicals free zone or or GMO free zone, and we can uh, really tackle all the uh, the problems at the same point. And this can can uh, can uh, can lead to avoid leakage as well. What is happening right now that's interesting as well in Brazil, like when a soybean wants to expand, even if it's over pasture, we have to be sure that the cattle that was in this pasture is not going to the forest. So what they are going, what they are developing right now is a, a deforestation free certificate. And the soy producer pays a, a, a little bit for the certificate to guarantee that this uh, cattle is not going to a forest. And this money goes for a cattle produ producers to help them to intensify their production or to get technical assistance. So we can avoid the leakage and, and taking in consideration a, a whole area. So this could be a, another initiative, I know, and but it could be a solution. And one point that I think that sometimes we are missing is that we have to take in consideration like macroeconomics like if we really think uh, in the Amazon right now in Brazil, uh, the second biggest oil uh, reserve in Brazil is under the Amazon state, is in the core of the Amazon. And we have several dams besides uh, Belo Monte. And like in the Tapajó River Basin, we have more than 200 uh, dams that is being planned. So how is this going to affect um, um, deforestation and I think the major driver is not uh, agriculture anymore but how other countries and this is expanding for the whole basin so Brazilian uh, Development Bank, Bank is investing in Peru in Ecuador in Bolivia and so how do we convince uh, our economic ministers that to conserve is also uh, to conserve the forest is also very important Uh, well, the, the context I have experienced uh, a lot uh, is quite different than uh, Brazil and where big industries have a role. Uh, but uh, when, when you talked about leakages, it immediately came to my mind about the local level leakages that have taken place. Uh, what I have seen is, I mean, there was community forestry, now that has given to a community, and they have won that, and they have considered that that is their one. <laughs> And in order to give, put a less pressure on the community forestry, uh, they have given more pressure on the government forest. Uh, so slight degradation on government forest uh, took place. Uh, so it is a very local level of uh, uh, leakages, but the human behavior uh, may be uh, similar uh, uh, when you take into context. Uh, and how to address this is, again, um, Again, because the government was uh, the steward of the government forest, but it wasn't there to look after it. And when that somewhat degraded forest was given to another community for management, so they looked uh, after it. So they were uh, stewards. So I think if we can give this stewardship to the people who, who use it, I think we can avoid uh, this leakage problem. But I'm talking of a very local context. Uh, the international players might play a different game and would be a different context. Um, yeah, and then, yeah, I think on this ecological service, I have one experience, and just based on my experience and based on Nepal. So at one time, uh, we had planned to have a, a ecosystem service for water for Kathmandu because it comes from one national national park. Uh, so we had a, a kind of a proposed policy uh, to, give, uh, to give incentive to the local people there uh, in, the, in the upper area so that they can preserve water, uh, do not pollute it, and cut to get access to uh, good water. Uh, but a somewhat, uh, it didn't come into impl implementation and and then in the discussions, uh, a different opinion came. And the opinion was that when we just emphasize water, uh, then it might have some influence uh, there, like uh, they would have more ponds uh, in, the, in the upper region. Uh, and um, 
and if it's not preserved uh, properly, then it might lead to land degradation, erosion, and other things. So, so emphasizing one product for uh, ecosystem service could lead to some problem. That's what I guessed. Thank you. Uh, our time is up. So any last minute thoughts, Jacques? <laughs> Uh, yeah, to answer the, briefly the question, um, so uh, I like the idea of subsidizing, subsidizing uh, agroforestry landscape, and once you get to the idea of subsidizing, you can s have many, many imaginative uh, ideas, but the, the problem is that it's a, it's a political challenge to phase out subsidies in the rich countries, in spite of the fact we know they have perverse effect, but it's uh, the same political challenge to even talk about subsidies when it's about developing countries. So that's, I think, the, the problem that has to be solved. But as the carbon price goes down, maybe a carbon fund will actually more and more have to rely on public fund if there are no buyers. And uh, for uh, leakage, um, I think there's no way you can formally anticipate leakage, calculate how much leakage, where and when. I think there's no way you can do that. Um, the only thing you can do is make assumption about how overall reduce leakage. And maybe the more, more, the more value you put on the forest by subsidizing it, and the more you can expect some forest will remain in place, even if you don't know exactly where and how. And, uh, there's also the problem of the demand. As long as there will be the same demand for forest products, for log, for uh, uh, land, well, you will have this, uh, how did you call it, that game? Whack-a-mole. Yeah, you will have, uh, leakage is actually whack more stuff. Huh? Uh, now, if you reduce the demand, or if you certify more certification, less demand, less demand for land by moving to area which has already been deforested to, to make extensive soybean cultivation, then you also will reduce leakage because you will reduce demand. Okay, so uh, just a quick uh, rejoinder, um, which is, um, you should actually Google whack a mole and just watch it visually. It, it really does actually symbolize the the, um, the challenges that we face in, in, in forest governance, um, in a fun way, actually. Um, now, the, but Jacques, I do want to come back to a point you just made, which is that, again, the instruments you were talking about were some kind of economic instruments, subsidies, and so on. And we've seen to lost this idea that we also can actually just designate land, and so you can't do things there regardless of the cost. Right? And actually, many advocate privatization as a way of improving management. When we know that by doing that, you often lose biodiversity and other uh, resources and impacts that if you want to go back and achieve later, you must then pay those new owners for. But if the land hadn't been privatized in the first place, it wouldn't even be an issue. So the broader context in which we think about instrument choice here that we're often forgetting, again, by going to the weeds and looking at market mechanisms and not standing back and asking, what is it we want to achieve? And I would encourage this conference and all of you to first ask the questions, what do we want to achieve? Um, and then, what are the mechanisms that best help us achieve that? Um, versus the, the tail wagging the dog or, or the whack-a-mole problem occurring. But let me thank, um, join me in thanking our three panelists for a really fantastic discussion and set of presentations about the importance of the details in these broader questions. Um, so if you can talk now. Uh, I, I also wanted to say, I know you have a chance again, but I do want to uh, really thank our students in this school who put on a fantastic uh, conference. Um, I've been working with Karen Peterson and Daisy Hay Lopez, but there's a bunch more as well. So I think you, they all know who you are, but if you guys could just stand up for one second, the students who've been involved in the conference. If you could just all stand up, please. Thank you. Thank you. We, we are really proud of our students, so thank you very much for all you do for the school and for the planet. Okay, now we're having a break, and you, you come back in, I think, 15 minutes. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah.
community uh, for the photo competition uh, uh, this year. Uh, there were two phases in this photo competition in which we first uh, got a submission of 48 photos that were first uploaded to the ISTF Facebook page for the Yale FES community to choose their favorite five, photo, uh, five favorite photos online to put their likes on it. Um, and then the second phase was this during this conference in which 16 photos with the highest numbers of votes were selected to be shown during the conference. And then votes were submitted to determine the top three photos. Um, Okay, uh, the winners are going to receive uh, a coupon for gourmet foods at Nikas, and we thank them for supporting us with this competition. And the winners are... Uh, <laughs> third place, Insect and Branch, uh, by David Emmerman. <laughs> The second place, uh, Yerba el Agua by Karen Peterson, the head of this ISTF conference. And the first place, our big favorite, Sky Jellies by Leah Meth. Now we would like to give uh, the word to uh, uh, we also like to, so now we would like to invite Mark Bradford, uh, Bomford, uh, the director of the Yale Sustainable Food Project, to invite the panels for the next discussion. Mark here. Thanks very much. I, <clears throat> I suppose that means I invite the panelists for the next discussion. Um, based on that prompt. Um, if, um, <coughs> I'm, I'm happy actually that the names are printed here on both sides, uh, helpful for everybody involved. Um, if you see your name uh, up here, please join me <laughs> at the front table and I will provide a better introduction and we can um, start the uh, scintillating discussion. Is the Pell mic working at this point? Excellent. <clears throat> Thank you, everybody, very much. Um, it's uh, been very good to chat with you in and out of this conference over the last couple of days. And um, I know the thanks have been given again and again uh, to the organizers, uh, but uh, I will just reiterate one more time uh, how thrilled I've been to be uh, working with the students who put this conference on and uh, how much it's made me appreciate um, how fortunate I am to be working at this institution uh, just because of the quality of the students, our guests, the discussion, the ideas, and uh, all of the projects which they are going to launch. And it is with that goal to synthesize some uh, wonderful ideas and uh, launch some wonderful collaborations and projects that we wanted to tie this final panel together. Um, with um, ten, 10 of you, almost nine, um, I, I don't know if it qualifies as a panel uh, per se. Uh, my, my goodness, there's a lot of you. Um, and it does mean that as we introduce the topics that will be there for discussion, we won't be proceeding with uh, everyone taking a shot at it. More, I would like to introduce a couple questions that are actually based on the quandaries from the introductory keynote. And then we're going to move into some questions that are asking more about what the next collaborative steps can be. I'd like to keep things to about 15, 20 minutes for the first introduction of quandaries and discussion of those. And so you are going to have to be a little bit um, uh, self-moderating just because the gestures that can actually be seen by all of you are going to be you know, violent by the time they make it down to the end of the line. So um, please, uh, consider uh, whether you're able to uh, keep your statement to about one minute when it comes to the quandaries and then we'll quickly shift on to the next. Um, <coughs> I have met some of you. I'm just going to uh, introduce uh, Jonah, Diane, Sarah, Karen. Uh, 
do, do, do we have it all in order here so far? Uh, so, uh, Jacques. Um, oh, I, I need to uh, put you on the list, Jacques. Uh, Jagannath yep. and uh, Peter, Selena, and Betsy. Um, so I've seen some of your work over the last couple of days, but not all of it. So uh, we're going to get some new tidbits out as well. I wanted to bring us back to that introductory keynote. When Francis gave a speech, brought some ideas to the forefront, and offered four quandaries. Now, we've had a lot of discussion since introducing those four quandaries. So while I will reacquaint you with them, we're actually going to combine some of them and add a little bit to the quandaries as our first discussion points. So the four quandaries were, first of all, one, how should we frame the forest and food security issue when communicating with various audiences? The second one is, should we dismantle the barriers between the forestry world and the agriculture world and talk only about landscapes? The third, very appropriate to the last discussion, how do we design market and governance mechanisms to protect forests that respect local rights and give way to legitimate food security concerns at different scales? And then finally, given the multiple challenges of mobilizing and the urgency of mobilizing, how do we actually focus our efforts? Now, as I said, we're going to uh, tweak this a little bit. And the first thing that I would like to invite feedback on from the panel is a little bit of a combination of the first two quandaries. Because when you're asking about framing and when you're asking about dismantling barriers, you're into the very uh, similar themes of uh, strategic communications of the issue, strategic alliances uh, that you may either want to build. In some cases, I think there was the insinuation that a strategic division could be a useful effort. So in this question about framing and how you state who you are, who your audiences are, who the stakeholders are, who you're working for, or what the objectives are, I know, small topic. I'm wondering if I can turn it over to uh, the whole panel, and if anyone is bold to begin, to say what you found out of the discussions of the last day and a half that most influenced your view of a new way of framing and communicating this issue strategically. And then we'll take uh, three or four comments and move into the next synthesized question. And as a prompt, you can also <laughs> take from any of the panels you attended over the last two days, uh, perhaps the most inspiring framing situation that you learned about as a case study from someone else's work. I'll go. Um, I actually think today was really interesting with Jacques' presentation um, in framing. Um, and thinking about the question in the back, I'm sorry, I forget your name, and the yellow sweater, but Julia, and asking how can, and this is in relation to forests and food security actually, is how can shifting cultivation, what Jacques, you were doing, I think is really interesting, how can that be made legible to forest carbon markets, right? And so my question more is that we, I think your question wasn't, exactly answered and I think it's an important one to think about is that how can those kinds of complex interrelationships in forests be made legible to these carbon markets so that their rights are secured to food and their livelihoods while at the same time we have this global agenda for carbon forestry and I guess anyone can answer that's what I think is really interesting I would like to know about Just quickly on, on framing, I know one of the, the speakers on food security started out saying, what do we think of as food? And also to back up the other side and say, what is a forest when we're talking about a forest and frame it with our understanding of, of how we all see forests and maybe how to work with that, that maybe this idea that people have of a pristine forest is imaginary to begin with and how can we reconceive our idea of what forests could be or should be or what they are and also to remind people that are really pro-conservation of forests that they also eat food, um, and that food comes from somewhere as well. Um, I will say something also about framing. 
Um, I will be cautious about the, the world and the concept of framing. Maybe there is too much framing. Maybe that's the problem. Um, I mean, when you do a PhD, and I guess it's the adventure that we all have or did have here or so, soon will have, but when you do a PhD, uh, there's always that re expectation that we frame our subject, that we use a given analy analytical, uh, uh, conceptual uh, frame, uh, some methods, some theory, etc. But when you are living, you are facing problem. You want to solve a problem you are involved in your life. What will framing mean in that concept? I mean, are, aren't, aren't we just trying to solve the problem, picking up everything that we think, you know, uh, in an opportunistic way can help to solve that problem? And if we frame, isn't there a risk that maybe some solution that is going to passing around, we, we just miss it because it's not in the frame? So when I did my PhD, I asked a question, how to stop deforestation in Madagascar without asking, requiring the marginalized or the poorest people to pay the price for it? That's it. I mean, I don't know if that's what you mean by framing in the sense of asking a very specific question, or if it is more than that. And if it is more than that, I think we really have to be cautious about that. Well, when I think about this gets to the audience too and our and the focus. So see so we talk about food and we talk about forests. So where are the people in that? Where are the institutions? Where are the rural communities? Why you know, where are the territories? I mentioned the word terroir, which is one of my favorite words. Um, you know, where is the uh, not just the market incentives or policy incentives, but sort of cultural incentives to maintain a landscape. I, I had issues with landscape when it first came out because it doesn't really convey a human territory, you know. And it, I think if we don't have human territories and people who will sustain those human territories, it doesn't matter what kind of, because the incentives are never going to be enough. The market incentives or the policy incentives, I don't think, are ever going to be enough to, to make that happen. Um, maybe we can talk a little bit later about what it would take to keep people, you know, to provide that sort of holistic approach to keeping people and valuing a territory, whether it be for, well, multiple, multiple uses and services. Um, I think coming back from what Professor Kashur mentioned, like what do we want to achieve? And when we frame, we have to be very clear that we want to achieve uh, forest conservation and at the same time food production. So how can we I would say that we have to talk with uh, decision makers, especially taking in consideration macroeconomics decisions and how is how forest is important to keep not only the uh, commodity production, but as well as uh, the food that is coming to, to our uh, plates every day. You know? And we have to provide some incentives for those people who are really producing those this kind of food. Um, uh, what what I think um, is uh, the problem in linking uh, forest to food security uh, also lies in our uh, understanding of biodiversity, and a lot of contentions uh, comes from um, uh, comes from uh, the kind of thinking about biodiversity uh, and uh, understanding. Um, uh, a different actors' perspective on biodiversity. For example, uh, forestry people, agricultural people, and the users uh, who use the forest. It could be shifting cultivators, it could be uh, peasant farmers like in Nepal, because they have different perspective on biodiversity. Uh, because of this, uh, I think there is uh, contentions uh, among the actors uh, in terms of conserving biodiversity. So, uh, I think some, some discussion on uh, understanding biodiversity uh, from people's perspective uh, would be also very much uh, important. Uh, so if this happens, uh, I think uh, uh, there is uh, any scope to increase uh, food security uh, from forestry. That's what I feel. I'll maybe give an example of something that I think is, is an unproductive uh, but common frame, which is either or. 
between conservation and production. And so questions come up uh, that I hear often, something like, you know, the, the palm oil industry is a multi tens of billions of dollar industry in Indonesia. The soy industry, multi tens of billions of dollars in, in Brazil. How can we ever stop that with our small pots of money for environment? And I think that, that really leads quickly to despair because the answer is, of course, you can't stop it. And, and really, when you think about it, you wouldn't want to stop it. You wouldn't want to stop soy production. Uh, but the much more helpful frame is, is marginal uh, thinking at the margin. It's about reconciling two very important goals of food security and climate. And then you think about red. You're not stopping palm oil. You're not even stopping deforestation from palm oil. You're trying to reduce deforestation from palm oil. And so then you start thinking, well, what if we you know, instead of stopping all palm oil everywhere, you have places where you would have maybe uh, a district thinking about 50% deforestation. Instead, they do 25%. That's a big gain for the climate, and some of that palm oil production could be produced elsewhere. You, you just open up your mind to many more solutions. Peter? Sure. Um, yeah, so one of the, uh, I guess one of the, points that stuck with me from, I guess, I think, I think only Xiao Teng was the one to, to sort of explicitly mention um, wastage uh, as, a, as a component of this sort of food forest system that we perhaps don't think enough about in the sense that so much of what we currently do is so inefficient. And, and, and Karen touched on it as well um, in talking about the possibilities for increasing production um, without removing any more forest. Um, just through more efficient use of what's already there in terms of pasture land in Brazil. Um, there's a huge amount of degraded land in, uh, in Indonesia that can be more, it is more suitable for palm oil, um, or, or is suitable for palm oil and uh, would have obviously less uh, environmental impact than, um, than cutting more primary forest. Um, and then just the current distribution of, of the food that we currently produce and how much of that is, um, is, it never, is, is wasted and is thrown away and never reaches the, the table. Um, I think there's a lot of, uh, inf of, of increased efficiency that we could do about what we eat uh, and how we distribute it um, that, that is a big part of this picture that perhaps we don't talk enough about. Selena, now yeah. because everyone else has had a chance sure. to Sure, uh, yes, I just wanted to share uh, a framework that, w that came up out of our discussion yesterday on the integration of forest and nutrition and if uh, such a framework was uh, viable. Um, so when we think about framing, I think it's important to think about uh, creating frameworks for different audiences um, and perhaps for a policy audience, uh, one of the frameworks that uh, sort of came out of the discussion yesterday was uh, framing it in a crisis sort of situation. Um, could perhaps be effective. So looking at more of a, as a defense, uh, like a national defense issue, uh, may be uh, one way to go. Maybe just to synthesize on that question, um, the idea of crisis framing as a strategic communications objective, almost how do you market something uh, so nuanced, complex, uh, and what you're pushing forward is not a sound bite capturable objective. So is there value in uh, using some kind of crisis framing for strategic policy objectives. Um, maybe I'll just put that out to uh, the thoughts of the panel. We talked about the power both from Selena, the idea of uh, national security, uh, national integrity, sovereignty issues. Um, and also in that panel, there was some discussion about the uh, overwhelmingly compelling power of the feeding nine billion idea and how it has uh, overwhelmed many other uh, policy directions uh, being taken along for that uh, particular ill-defined goal. Um, so given that, given the imperfection of it, but the incredibly compelling power from a policy arena that some of these uh, crisis framings have, um, is this a direction which is valuable to go in? Yes. Well, speaking off the record, I guess, on, 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 that, on that issue, um, when the food crisis came out and our agency responded, I think there, there was an immediate thought to jump into uh, staple food crops and increased production of staple food crops. And so because it was framed as a crisis, it kind of the old, these mindsets, you know, crept back in that we just need to produce more food, even though we've known for you know, decades that that's really not what uh, food food security is about. 
I wanted to mention that for me, the framing of food security as being not just about producing more food, but about quality of food and diversity of food was really, really key. But there's been a rethinking that we just came out as an agency, we just came out with a resilience strategy. And one reason of that was stepping back a little bit from the whole, like we just have to produce more food to looking at um, places like the Sahel or, and you know the Horn of Africa that are fragile. And you know, if you just try to produce more food, it's it's going to uh, you know risk damaging ecosystems, or it's just not even going to be feasible. And you have to really um, stop focusing more on the humanitarian and much more on the longer term drivers of food insecurity. So I think the crisis mentality is probably not the best way to frame those issues because it, it just it, it tends to drive uh, shorter term. Uh, responses. I, um, I agree with Diane, and I think that, for instance, when we use the um, the severe drought that happened in the U.S. last summer, and the whole media in the whole world put a lot of uh, attention on this, and this lead to an increase of production in Brazil. So an increase of uh, soy production and other crops. So, and this could have lead to more deforestation and other impacts as well. So we have to be very careful when we think about uh, bringing a crisis. I think at some point it can help. But nowadays, I believe that communications in the, the whole world can affect what, what happens here, can affect there. And we have to be very cautious how we frame and what are these responses for this crisis? We cannot only incentivize the, um, the rise of production or the, the increase of production, because this could lead to other problems as well. Yeah, uh, I think in some way the right framing for an issue emerges naturally uh, if we have the right approach. Um, I mean, what I mean is that there's something uh, I don't use a lot of statistics or a lot of quantitative in my in my research, but there's something I always want to measure, and I hope I will measure it someday. That's the correlation between the number of days or weeks or months that a person, an expert, a red expert or a food security expert or a sustainable development expert, spends in a village, in a village where are living the people who are actually shaping the world, shaping the countryside, shaping the forest, shaping the farming system, shaping the food production system. Uh, and to correlate that with uh, their framing or the idea they have about how to solve those problems. And I think your correlation would be huge. So when I, I, when I say that there's a natural framing that could emerge, I think that if, uh, if every person involved in a red debate uh, will have actually spent six months in the village where are living the people who are actually going to determine the fate of the forest in the future, I think there will be a consensus that emerges. And there will be the right framing that emerges. And we could say the same thing f for many other issues. The problem is that it doesn't happen. Most, you know, um, expert that we are, you know, we have to struggle to negotiate even for, uh, with any institution we work with to actually spend some time uh, doing field work and really interacting closely with the people. I remember thinking many times if uh, only it was a requirement that policymakers uh, were, were required to make a living off of uh, farming for uh, one year of their lives, one season, uh, it would change the framing quite uh, significantly. <laughs> I do want to shift gears, though, a little bit to the third question uh, that was asked uh, at the beginning. And it's very relevant to pick up on the discussion that was happening this morning. Uh, about scale of uh, governance, about the uh, locally adaptive and responsive policies, and the problem that, uh, the, the whack-a-mole problem, I'm just happy that I got a chance to use that phrase again, um, when you have a uh, well-developed, uh, context-specific local policy strategy applied and the problem just pops up uh, in some other jurisdiction in the absence of a larger uh, governance regime. So I wanted to, um, uh, ask you some of the thoughts that came up about strategies for achieving the kind of joined up uh, policy strategies that would be necessary to have the locally responsive uh, policies not just fall prey to whack-a-mole of having the problem pop up in another jurisdiction again. 
Yeah. Glad you asked this question. There's, uh, since the beginning of red as a thing, this has always been one of the questions, and so it's been answered from the beginning with a number of um, important design features. So one is red as a national policy intervention, that emission reductions from deforestation are measured and compensated at the level of an entire country rather than a project site or a village. And by making it, that incentivizes governments to make interventions at, at policy reforms at a level that are simply beyond uh, the scope and mandate of individual villages, and by doing so control uh, leakage, or if leakage happens, it's not, uh, it, it's deducted from the compensation that's, that's heading to those countries. So that's probably the most important feature of RED for, for controlling leakage. Um, the second in the international negotiations, the international issue is the issue of broad participation. So you have some countries with rapid deforestation, lots of emissions loss, uh, you know, Brazil, Indonesia, the biggest two, and then others, whereas you have some other countries that have large areas of forest, but as uh, you know, up till the present have been pretty good in maintaining very low rates of deforestation in the Congo Basin and the Guyana Shield. And so it's very important that these country, the countries of these regions are incentivized to participate in a red system as well. And this, po this probably means uh, a structure of incentives that looks a little bit different from payments for reducing deforestation. It probably means payments for maintaining deforestation at an extremely low present rate. Um, just to add on the question of scale, which I think is a great question, to not only look at spatial scales, but temporal scales. And especially when we're talking about agroforestry and trees, trees are trees, they grow very slowly. So I think if I, to answer Diane's question, if you had the elevator speech, one recommendation to help collaborations in these projects develop that I, I would have is go through a document whenever you see a time frame put by an aid agency at a zero on the end of it. And, and, <laughs> Uh -huh. <laughs> um, and also along with that, the, that successes don't happen all or nothing and, and to get, get beyond an idea that it's either failed or succeeded and see that, that you could have some things work and some things not with the whack-a-mole. So it's always, you're always trying to, to, to move forward, but to know that it's not going to all happen the first, the first try. Any other thoughts on some of the uh, scale and boundary problems? Well, we know that, uh, particularly in Africa, that um, still the vast majority of forests are still owned and managed by the state. And we also know that without local community ownership or buy-in to uh, forest management, it's probably not going to be effective. So that's a, that's a big challenge that governments have to face, and they have to face it at the national level. They have to, there has to be tenure reform and it has to be done sensitively and, but not overly complexly as we've learned over many years in community forestry. You start out with these complex systems and then, you know, they don't work and then you have to simplify. So that's something we could get started with right away and encourage uh, uh, countries to just do it. Did anybody learn um, any inspiring examples or workable examples of uh, the non-state mechanisms for um, uh, achieving some of these policy objectives in the discussions over the last day or two? I talked about them, so I'm a very, <laughs> <laughs> I believe on them and I, I really believe that the, the private sector can play a very important role not only on to stop reducing deforestation and um, leading to issues with food security. And we can mention, for instance, uh, for the smallholders, for the very remote areas in the Amazon, uh, the state sometimes cannot reach them, but the companies or some companies are there selling their products or technical assistance. So we need, or we could develop some uh, public-private partnership so the companies can help the local government, lo local municipalities or the state government to 
get on those very remote areas. So I think there is a huge space for us to develop more uh, commitments or more dialogue with the, with the private sector. Yeah, for Red in Congo, uh, there are private operators. There are uh, at least uh, three projects run by uh, private companies, uh, including one that we visited. And um, so I think uh, those private op operators can really play a great role uh, if they are working in the right boundaries, in the right uh, rules. Uh, so, of course, there's the, the responsibility of the government and uh, other stakeholders partnering with the government to define those rules. Uh, for example, the Committee National Red now is uh, creating a tool uh, which would be uh, online where every private project will register. So uh, what they do, what are their purpose, their methods uh, will be transparent. So that's a way to help, you know, uh, guaranteeing that those private operators will do something that's good for the public. And there is also something very interesting in those, uh, in this red project that we visited. It's actually the, f it's the fact that the, um, the, the head of the private companies, at least the, su at least the subsidiary that is based in Congo, is a Congolese who originate from the area where the red project is implemented. And he really has a commitment to do something for his community, for his region, uh, because he observes that there is just no state. The state is not there, that since the 80s, uh, everything collapsed. And uh, so someone else, some other organization have to take over the state. And uh, this is why uh, he wants the, the red project to really contribute also to build schools, to build health center. And uh, in, the, in the Congolese culture, and that's something that I felt to see reading other documents about the, another red project, which also has behind him uh, a personality who originate from the area uh, where the red project, where it, it, maybe it was not a red project, it was a carbon sequestration, the Ibi Bateke. And here also there is someone who originate from a region and then design this project and get carbon payment. And those two persons, they seem to have an idea of commitment to the community, which we can, uh, which makes me think to uh, the concept of the moral economy. So they are leaders, they are making business, they are actually from family of chiefs, but they want to, f to find some way to redistribute the benefit to, to the world community. Uh, so they are like playing the the game of, of, of the state at the scale of their of their community and of their region. So it's quite an interesting process to look at. Yeah. Um, actually, Betsy, did you have um, a comment before or no? Okay, then please go ahead. <laughs> I just wanted to mention that we we referred to state and private sector. Uh, I think we should also look into the role of uh, civil society. Uh, civil society in the sense like uh, I include NGOs, um, federations of um, people who manage resources. So in my context it is um, like uh, we call it FECOFON, Federation of uh, Community Forestry User Groups, uh, which can play a strong role uh, to preserve the rights of the uh, uh, user groups, forest user groups. Uh, and I've experienced that uh, uh, organizing these users in, in such, uh, such a way uh, empowers uh, the users uh, of the forestry. Uh, they can, uh, they can uh, negotiate with the state. That power has come from that. So the role of civil society is also important. It could be different in different contexts. The discussion about, I think, broadening the scope to uh, make sure that we've got uh, uh, perhaps non-traditional stakeholders represented in the processes, um, that we're building some strange coalitions perhaps between the public, private, voluntary, civil society sectors. Um, that will lead me to the first part of the last question, um, where I'm going to ask if there are any uh, collaborations that we should be embarking on, groups that we should be inviting to work together who previously have been working separately. And I do want to compliment the organizers of this conference for bringing some of the people on the agricultural side of the table, uh, for bringing someone like me into this discussion. Um, it has, it, it's been something that we haven't really done before uh, in the work that I've been doing. The divisions have remained quite solid, and so uh, this is a wonderful start. 
but I'm thinking beyond the food and ag people and the forestry conservation people, are there uh, particular stakeholder groups that would be really beneficial to bring into the discussion and to begin collaboration with, perhaps at this conference? Yes, uh, I'm really concerned about what is going on, for instance, in Brazil right now. Uh, I think I mentioned this before, like the major threat right now is infrastructure projects. And we have to start talking to the to Brazilian Development Bank and we have to start talking with the uh, uh, economists and the people who are just building infrastructure like dams and are maybe releasing the oil projects and and roads construction so because they are making this these decisions they have a lot of money a lot of power and i don't think they realize or they do not sometimes they do not know uh, all the all the issues that we are bringing as uh, con for conserving the forest or for increasing food production so we really need to talk with the uh, with the people who are who who are the economic drivers of the of those countries of those economies and maybe at a smaller scale we have actors that are invisible but very powerful in the economy like um, chainsaw loggers, artisanal loggers, artisanal miners, bushmeat hunters. Um, when we had the Liberia Forest Dialogue, we invited some of those folks to come and talk to big private sector government officials, um, uh, donors, and it was instructive because I mean, these are people who make their livelihoods, but as I say, they're in invisible on the policy angle. Um, and their, their value isn't captured um, either by communities or by the state. And if we can find a way to somehow bring them into the picture, we could, everyone would benefit. Um, I'd like to talk about a, li a little bit about an example from Colombia. It wasn't something that came up in this weekend, um, but it's about collaboration and it's about the role of non-state actors in your last question. And, uh, you know, I, I, I think the reason we tend to or, or really should tend to think first about the state actors in this uh, problem is because the state is a great way to solve a, collection, a collective action problem. And if you don't have someone doing that, it's difficult to ask individual farmers to, to turn aside from practices which are generating market income for them to something which is providing a global good but for which they receive no compensation. Uh, so s states can solve that problem. Um, I was in Colombia a few months ago and, and talking to the, the head of research of the Colombian Ministry of Environment, and she said that their plan was to work very closely with the Association of Cattle Ranchers in their country uh, to provide incentives and, and, and policy inducements for them to reduce their emissions as a collective. Uh, this, she told me that they're a very strong, well-organized uh, industry association, and she thought that if, uh, you know, the right mixture of, of carrots and sticks were in place, that they could, could organize amongst themselves and figure out much more effective, uh, flexible, and, and, and palatable ways for them to reduce their, their emissions as an industry uh, relative to what you know, her, her ministry could have come up with. And so I, I thought that's a, that's a very interesting possibility and it's the sort of thing that comes out of having uh, a framework like RED where you have international rules being set but really flexibility and freedom given to individual countries or subnational units to, to figure out how they will uh, achieve the problem in their own, uh, solution of the problem in their own way. So I was mentioning before that the, the state almost disappear and that private actors are substituting to it, uh, tr sometimes trying to do it in a responsive way to give service to the world community. But the state didn't disappear completely. The state is poor. But the state in Congo is the only institution that has representatives all over. So basically every small administrative unit, you go, you have an agronomist, you have a representative from the Ministry of the Environment, and those people, they know what they are talking about. They might not be the best PowerPoint experts, you know, maybe, uh, but 
they really know what they are talking about because when I was mentioning, you know, the criteria of the number of nights someone is spending in a village, those people, they spend a lot of time in the village and talking with people. And so I think, um, unfortunately, they are totally absent. They are totally invisible. Even locally, even most projects, most NGO uh, basically don't work with them. And I think that's a little bit a shame. And so they also should be among us and tell us uh, stories about what they know about those countries where we are working and when we try to do something. Yeah, yeah I guess I just um, would uh, caution against, like, you yeah, may be caution against uh, ignoring too much the non-state actors. I think it's I think um, private engaging private sector uh, and thinking about the demand and supply side of a lot of this is is hugely important. Um, not least because the obviously the interests and the influence of of state actors, um, but almost by definition stops at national boundaries. But as as was really importantly pointed out, and I'm sorry I didn't get your name, um, leakage does not stop at national boundaries. And um, and when we're talking about global problems in global, global systems um, in terms of deforestation, in terms of carbon. Um, if we can solve a problem in one country, but if it shifts it to another, then as, as you quite rightly point out, that's, we haven't solved the problem at all. Um, and the private sector also does not stop in, at, at, at national boundaries. So if you, you might halt a, a company's or a, a commodities activities in one place, but it can easily shift to another. And we're seeing that, I guess, with, with palm oil and, and um, global demand continues to rise. And so maybe we can um, narrow the sort of uh, the, ex the extent to which palm oil is growing within a particular country. Um, but if global demand continues to rise, then it will be produced somewhere. And so I think we need to um, take that more holistic view. I mean, obviously, state actors have a part to play, but I don't think, I don't think it's a complete solution by any means. Um, oh, okay. I thought, in response to your last question, um, the groups that I think would be interesting to collaborate with are um, you know, discussions we had with Janice yesterday in terms of rights. And I think in my work, I work a lot with both state agencies in Tanzania who are committed to addressing rights-based issues as well as uh, civil society actors like grassroots organizations also in Tanzania. And um, I think in the discussion of food security, rights to food is parallel and integral to people's rights to use forests. Right. And so I think that um, how will those rights be acknowledged and how can we conceptualize that within this food security debate, but at the same time, this kind of red carbon market debate. And I think that's an interesting avenue to pursue in terms of how are these people who are working in the food security kind of sector looking at rights and people's rights to food? And how does that relate to people's rights in the forestry sector to use food, use forests for food? Thank you. Uh, Selena, do you have a comment? Um, yeah, I just was uh, thinking about collaboration um, and just collaboration within disciplines. So I think it's great to see uh, people collaborating with within forestry and agriculture and uh, uh, nutrition, but also sort of expanding that to other disciplines because food and forest really touches everybody's uh, lives. So just kind of increasing the collaborations uh, within disciplines. I'd like to turn that into the final part of the final question for the panel, uh, which is very much directed to the uh, audience here uh, who are busy uncovering, I think, the, uh, uh, the new understanding, uh, deepening our understanding of how the whole system works and what we can do with it. I want to ask about the research questions that uh, are most critical to be asking at this point and specifically research questions which we might be able to tackle within uh, this group, this audience, and this uh, network of practitioners. Jack, was that a, okay. I guess? I, I was waiting for the wave coming from, okay. Um, very broad research question. Uh, very large one. Everybody looks at the details. Nobody tries to put the details all together to get the big picture. Use the macroscope instead of the, mi uh, sorry, excuse my accent, microscope versus microscope. I mean, use the big thing that looks at the big picture. <laughs> Don't use the, the big thing that look at the, the small details. Uh, so ask very broad question, pick up, you know, all the knowledge you, that's already available there and uh, helps you to answer that question and then fill the gaps 
build the puzzles out of those pieces. And because those are the questions uh, policymakers need. In Madagascar, policymakers need to know how to stop deforestation. And you can accumulate tens and tens of PhD. None actually tries to answer that question. Um, well, the single research paper I can think of that's most applicable to this theme of the conference was, was by um, Foley et al., professor at Minnesota, and it's called something like Five Solutions for a, for a Cultivated Planet. Um, and it's, it's in nature, and it's this big picture, very macroscope uh, thing. And it's, 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 you know, I'm embarrassed that I can't name all five, but it's essentially saying, how, how do you produce agriculture and, uh, you know, keep a stable climate? Um, and it's, it, it has to do with food waste. It has to do with dietary shifts, it has to do with in agricultural intensification, it has to do with shifting where uh, cultivation occurs, and you know, maybe someone remembers the fifth, uh, and, and I'm sure we could also think and add sixth and seventh. Uh, but if, if, if you're out there as a, a PhD student or you know, doing research as a master's student and thinking, where do I do my research? I mean, I think these are the questions that will take um, you know, a, a, a thousand papers, 20 years to, to get an answer to, but every little uh, piece of the puzzle is going to be very, very helpful along the way. Um, I think, um, so the, uh, a lot of research on food security has been focused on agricultural land to me. Uh, that's. I mean, I, I asked the same question the second, yesterday. I was trained as a, uh, as a agronomist to work in green revolution uh, in Punjab, because Punjab is a green revolution area. So when they taught me, they never uh, thought about producing food in forest, producing food in uncultivated areas. Uh, and the major, major focus was on increasing yield from few crops. So that is, I mean, that's, that has been the reality of uh, uh, reality of the attempts, attempts to produce more food. And, and there has been critics and supporter of, the, of this approach uh, because uh, it has led to, like in the last uh, 50 years, led to three times increase in the yield of the crops. And we still think that with nine, million, 9 billion people Coming by 2050, we need to an increase yield by three more times, for which uh, we are going into uh, genetic engineering. That's called the second, uh, second uh, generation green revolution. <coughs> but we never have talked about how to produce more food uh, from uh, other landscape. So I think more research in this area uh, would be very much useful. Uh, that's what I feel. So maybe we should be focusing more on the solutions rather than the problems. I mean, looking at, we saw some beautiful complex agroforestry systems that are producing global public goods as well as local goods. How are those being sustained? Where are the systems where you see rich landscapes being sustained by people? What are the enabling conditions for that? Can we tease those out? I mean, I don't really necessarily believe in replicability, but at least understanding the conditions under which those those uh, rich landscapes can be su sustained and then trying to uh, communicate those uh, underlying conditions to policymakers instead of just focusing on problems. Let's focus on actual, you know, good examples. And as some of these concepts in the food and agriculture world of sustainable intensification or of climate smart agriculture or um, uh, say, say perhaps the, the sustainable diet idea uh, gain currency but lack definition, there is an opportunity perhaps to take some of these working models and insert them, at least their underlying principles and conditions, right. uh, to create the definition for these uh, popular uh, ideas that right now lack much definition. Um, so. Perhaps if you've got the uh, good agroforestry mosaic, productive, multifunctional, and that can somehow be inserted as this is what we mean by sustainable intensification, it would be a great service to the, uh, to the dialogue. Who knows? Um, I do want to see if we've got some time for some questions from the audience to the panel. 
uh, at this point. Um, I'm guessing since we started late, we're going to run a little bit over. Is that OK? Um, so do we have roaming microphones at this point? I've, I've got one here, if anyone wants a roaming mic. And I think uh, to begin with, right in front of me, I thank you much, very much to everyone who's spoken throughout the whole past three days. Um, one interesting thing for me from this whole conference was I had known from the forestry side that there is this perspective of protected forests without any agriculture, but then that there is such a variety going into use of some sort of sustainable use agroforestry. And then the nutrition side surprised me because we think of foresters, environmentalists, versus agriculture, and that it's not like that necessarily, that there might be big industrial staple crop agriculture, but then there can also be smallholder agriculture, shifting agriculture, and the nutritionists themselves want diversified systems and may even support agroforestry. So through this, I guess, agroforestry, including shifting cultivation and intercropping, came up as like, oh, yay, the answer. And kind of like what Diane just mentioned now, my question to you is, is this something that everyone in the in-between the strict forest reserves and the industrial agriculture should be rallying behind together? Is that desirable? Is it possible? Or, or are there problems with that? How do you want me to? Please, Diane. Well, uh, coming fr I worked in World Agroforestry Center before going to USAID, and we, um, we spent a lot of time promoting different agroforestry systems um, in different parts of Africa. And I would, I would caution against a, um, a sort of uncritical approach to promoting agroforestry systems because there are a lot of dimensions that relate to markets and labor and um, just adding biomass to a system. Um, there's a reason why people do slash and burn or, or swidden because, you know, it removes pests and diseases from the system. I mean, this is just maybe getting into the weeds a little bit, but, um, you know, because I see when we talk about sustainable intensification, a lot of energy around, you know, adding more biomass to the system. And just having spent years and years sitting with farmers in villages, I would caution, I would really focus a lot of research on how that's going to happen with given labor requirements, given markets, and given soil conditions. Yeah, agroforestry is really a funny concept. And it has an history, you know. Um, in the 80s, a bunch of people were marveled, you know, uh, discovering agroforestry all over the world, discovering all those uh, traditional systems that mix crops and trees. And there has been a few, um, a few surveys, you know, all around the world to identify those systems, making a typology. And, and then they thought, OK, that's great, so let's really support that. And in the end, they designed a series of technology, alley cropping, in fallow, contour strips, and little by little, agroforestry became that. It became those technologies, technological package designed based on a very committed, you know, uh, willingness to optimize biophysical cycle between the crop and the soil. And they were super efficient system biophysically, but economically or socially, were, they were not really acceptable. And Eventually, there was no, there's no big record of success of adoption of those uh, technologies. And the most extreme ones, like alley cropping, was even basically abandoned by, even by the people who designed the system. Now it's kind of all out of fashion. So the funny thing is that when you go now, still now in the countryside, you see NGO who promote agroforestry, who promote agroforestry to get rid of agroforestry. Because shifting cultivation is one of those marvelous agroforestry systems that people, you know, admire in the beginning. And now it's all about getting ri rid of that system and to replace it by the agroforestry in the sense of the technological package. So that's a really funny story. I think it's also in important to remember when you're uh, agroforestry kind of to echo that it's not all or appropriate everywhere is when you're bringing a new crop or a new tree to an area, you're not just bringing a material substance that you have to bring the knowledge of how to cultivate it. You have to, if people are spending time on that, there's something they're not spending time on. Instead, there's also a big cultural context that has to come along with just introducing new species to an area. 
So a very quick comment. I think the challenge is not how to implement agroforestry systems, but how we can bring the value back of agriculture to the smallholders. Because most of the smallholders that we deal with, especially in the Amazon, they don't want to be agriculture anymore. We have to bring this value of planting, of producing food for them. Most of them are just cattle ranchers or they just want to lease their land to big landowners and then move to the city. So how we can uh, bring it back, this value of really producing their own food? Just very quickly to follow up, because we were discussing this earlier, I mean, staple food crop production is a poverty trap in a lot of places, So, and because of low purchasing prices and just low returns uh, to, to uh, labor and land. So that's an issue that has to be faced. Otherwise, people are not going to be able to afford any more complex systems. Can we move to the next question? Uh, um, with regard to your question about the process framing and Professor Shore's um, discussion of how we define our problem definition, whether we're talking about food security or we're talking about livelihoods. Um, outside of the frame, it seems, and this isn't really a critique of the panel or the conference, but more a critique of time and what's available. In several presentations, there was a uh, brief mention of, 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 mig of migration as an approach and as a strategy. It seems that as far as livelihoods go, this is one that is somewhat outside of the frame. And it's one that uh, local people have used as a response. And it's one that uh, occurs in Madagascar, in Yunnan, in Nepal, certainly. Uh, in the Congo, and just to represent, you know, to think that not everything that happens, that decisions on the farm are very much uh, affected by what what's done off the farm, non-farm income, and what's brought back. So, just any any quick thoughts. Yeah. So, what will happen in the forest of Congo might depend to how the local system of those people living on the forest frontier will evolve, but it will also depend a lot on how systems, farming systems in other areas where there is no more forest for a while and where there is savanna will evolve because people move all the time. They are looking for opportunities. So people in savanna move to the forest when the soil degrades, but they don't like to move far away because they like to be, you know, in a place where they have a community, where there is an access to the market, where they, they can uh, get some services. So if you if you do something about the to support the agriculture in those savannas area, then they will stay and that will alleviate the pressure on the forest. So and I agree that this is um, those are connections that are not enough looked at by uh, by uh, policymakers. Also, in Congo, there's a bunch of people who are really aware of that. But you, you see them among the uh, mostly within the agricultural sector because the environmental sector they are really working on the forest. They, they don't see a lot of the dynamic in the um, in the savanna areas where the people really working on agriculture intensification they are committed to do something also about those uh, savanna areas. So that brings to the problem of bringing on the table uh, people addressing agricultural issues. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, we really have to be talking about robust rural economies. So we have to be talking about rural towns. We have to be talking about processing. We have to be talking about jobs and employment, because absent that, you're you're again you're going to get into poverty traps and people wanting to leave. And we were talking about, you know, urban migration. I mean, you're not going to stop that, and you're not going to get conservation and better food security when the rural areas are depopulated. Um, so. It's a whole system. It's not just about you know food production or, or forests. It's really about a whole production system that could be more more investment made in, in rural towns and in secondary industries that could att attract people and young people particularly. Thank you for bringing up the global context of urbanization to uh, add to your migration question there. I, I don't know if it had been fully addressed in some of the uh, discussions earlier. Selena, did you have a comment, or was that just a, yeah. a general agreement? Yes. Um, are there two more questions from the audience before we uh, wrap things up? Please. I, I have a, it, a thought to through to the panel and to hear your response to it. And it started with um, Jagannath's comment a couple of minutes ago about the prospects of answering some of the questions of our rising food needs in areas outside of forested 
landscapes? And I know this is a technological question, but I want you to imagine with me for a second what we could do with the Sahara Desert, for example, if we had the technology to answer our food needs in that space. It would probably solve the problem for a couple of people. And so the conservationist would be happy because his forest is not being degraded and the multinational companies that need palm oil would have the land that they need. I, I would like to hear your thoughts on that question because my colleague and I were speaking a few minutes ago and the truth is the people who are growing food are doing it for two reasons. They're either growing food at the subsistence level for their families or they're growing it for business. So how do we bridge that gap and are there solutions outside of the food forest dialogue to that can you know answer the question for both ends of the puzzle i think the main point is not about only forest that is being converted to produce food but we have to think about converted native vegetation mm -hmm. because what is going on in, in i was mentioned brazil again sorry but uh Forest like the Amazon is pretty well conserved right now, but what we are, we have we are seeing is that all the food production is going to the savanna to Brazilian cerrado. So what we want is not only to conserve the forest, but to conserve native vegetation in general. So we have to use already open it land, and I think it's not an issue of technology because we have space. It's how to use those the, the space that is already open or the areas that are already cleared in a more efficient way. And we have technology for this. I, I think it's much more about uh, uh, public policies to incentivate those producers to go to those areas. Jagannath, was there a... Uh, sorry, I'll just let you speak. Um, well, uh, maybe the context I imagine was, uh, uh, was Nepal. Um, so uh, it could be different things. But what I was saying is like... Um, I mean, uh, clearly there are different land uses within a landscape. Agricultural land is there. There are um, there is uh, uncultivated land, uh, bush land, forest, um, and within forest, different types of forest. Um, uh, in terms of uh, management style and in terms of composition of the forest structure of the forest. So my main concern is, uh, I mean, we need to go for sustainable uh, intensification of the farmland. That's there, but uh, a, a country like Nepal uh, not only faces uh, food insecurity uh, from like excess point of view, but also the availability is low. So we need to increase availability of all kinds of food, uh, wherever is possible. That's what I'm saying. So uh, yesterday, uh, I think it was uh, uh, there was a comparison between uh, a system where uh, traditionally managed forest uh, where tea was cultivated um, and then uh, a monoculture uh, tree was there. So the thing is what I'm saying is most of the research, most of the research funding from development agencies, international agencies goes for promoting uh, monoculture in the farm. Uh, but if we also had kind of, uh, because we do research for improvement so if we had uh, more research on uh, like uh, agroforestry system uh, where we can produce uh, more food, better food, uh, it would certainly increase our uh, food stock. Uh, there are other questions of excess is there, but we also have to uh, increase the food stock. That's what I was saying. So uh, we, we had a very, we, uh, our traditional farming system is very complex, producing diversified food system. Somehow, uh, the present, uh, this uh, green revolution system is not able to capture that uh, whole dynamics of the uh, traditional uh, food production system. So the only thing I was saying is we need more research uh, to, to produce more food from such system without destroying the system. So we need to do more research. And that's what I was mentioning. Jonah? Um, yeah, I think you bring up an excellent point, and I'd like to reiterate uh, Brazil as a success story, Karen showed us that really striking figure that, that everybody should know that's, that's seen Brazil's deforestation go down by more than 80% in the last decade. And the climate contribution of that has been uh, as great or, or even greater 
than all of Europe under the Kyoto Protocol. I mean, a massive global uh, significant uh, climate impact of stopping deforestation. And, and what, uh, what wasn't there, but, but I find just as interesting, is that soy production and cattle production didn't drop by 80% uh, over that time period. It didn't even drop by 1%, it went up. It was, it was going up, up, up over that same time period. Uh, and the main reason for that was more uh, and, and more efficient production in the non-forest areas. Um, and so I think you bring up a great point of sort of de decoupling uh, the places where the, the, the deforestation, you know, the forest frontier activities are occurring and your agricultural intensification activities are occurring. Uh, because as Frances pointed out in her keynote, um, it's, it's probably, there's reasons to be very wary of increasing the intensification in those same villages at the frontier because you're bringing in technologies that make land more profitable to clear those very lands. But it may be the case you've got a breadbasket uh, somewhere in Brazil that's far, far away from the, the current frontier areas in Brazil, and then you start drawing the migration that one of the, the previous questioners brought up, uh, and, and the economic growth just away from the forests. Um, Diane and then Jacques. Well, I think we could be doing a lot more, and a lot more is being done in urban and peri-urban spaces with the right incentives. I don't know about you guys, but I grow a lot, some of my own food in my backyard in Washington, D.C., and the Kahlo City movement is big in, in D.C. A lot of people are using uh, community-supported agriculture that's close into the city, and, and that you know, has the potential for increasing the space for food production you know, closer into urban populations. There's a very big difference between uh, doing agriculture in forest and doing it in, in savanna or in area which has maybe not the same potential Im immediately visible. When you do agriculture in the forest, you just need an axe and a match and seeds. You use the natural capital, you convert it into fertilizer and you have a bloom of cassava, it's beautiful and you feed your family if you don't have a disease in the field. Uh, now, if you do agriculture on, uh, on the savanna, well, the soil is not the same. It's hard. It has been degraded by fires over the years. Usually, it's an anthropogen anthropogenic system, not always, but it's often an anthropogenic degraded ecosystem. So you need to invest something. You need to constitute a capital of exploitation. And, uh, and this causes uh, many policymakers to consider they should give the savanna to the agribusiness because the agribusiness has the money. So the counterpart, I mean, the, the, the corollary of shifting the frontier from the forest to the savanna is that you have to devise, to design a policy that's going to support the smallholder to acquire this capital ex of uh, exploitation, which can be, you know, a pair of oxen and a plow, which can be a cart to evacuate the product which can be maybe, why not? It's not taboo, some fertilizer or something to get rid of the weeds because you have more weeds. Huh? Uh, and so to accompany this transition by provi providing the right support. Otherwise, you give the savanna to the agribusiness and what's left to the smallholder is, is the forest. I'd just like to throw in a little bit of a cautionary case study and then uh, uh, take the final question. Um, your question about uh, applying technology and capital, uh, especially in areas that are non-forested or what would be considered marginal, it, it just brought to mind the uh, largest dairies that exist in the world, the largest dairy systems that exist in the world right now, which are in the deserts in Saudi Arabia. Um, and I don't know if you've uh, taken a look through some of these systems, but they're kind of the, the, the pinnacle of industrial agriculture, if you will. Uh, absolutely vast, uh, very, very low labor inputs, um, astronomical uh, capital and fossil fuel inputs, because of course it's essentially a, a vast hydroponic system growing in the complete absence of soil, uh, pumping up water uh, from far down below, um, uh, drawing it out at tremendous rates, and then using every uh, latest technological tool in the agronomic toolbox uh, to create these uh, huge, huge dairy systems, growing alfalfa and feed grains and putting them into these massive dairies out in the desert. Um, and if you look at, of course, the long-term uh, prospects for replicating a system like that, um, there are 
really no other countries in the world where you would find the right combination of excessive fossil fuel uh, availability and capital availability. And then the downstream consequences of actually burning that up if you had it, uh, you all know where that goes. The energetics of it are um, uh, not, not particularly good. So I, I guess just looking at uh, what the implications are as you pursue the technology intensive, capital intensive um, cultivation of the more marginal areas in the world and how that affects it, um, we do have some case studies out there that can let you know what that trajectory ends up with. So I just offer that. Um, final question, and it goes to Joe. Hi, thanks everyone for your fascinating perspectives on these issues. Um, I was a grower in the Hudson Valley um, for a few years, for five, five seasons before I came here. Um, now I'm studying ecology, carbon cycling and nitrogen cycling, and agroforestry applications for temperate climates. Um, there's been a con sort of consensus here, or at least a, um, a common thread of looking at the political ecology and policy solutions um, for these types of questions of food and forests. And I'm curious, as someone who's studying ecology now, um, if there are basic science and applied science questions that you feel over the next 10 years could contribute to the work that you're doing, or if the questions really are of a hybrid nature of applying scientific solutions that already exist, of um, generating the political willpower or the policy solutions to um, create you know, some answers to these questions or if, as a young ecologist, there's questions that you'd like me to focus on. <laughs> Good. Yeah. I, well, oh. Jonah. No, go ahead. Oh, Selena, then Jonah. Oh, okay, so the basic uh, research question that I think is really important, uh, which I'm starting to focus on, is sort of looking at the impacts of climate change on food quality, uh, which I think is a really fascinating uh, research question, and if there are agricultural or forestry uh, methods to sort of mitigate the impacts of climate change on food quality. Uh, Jonah. Okay. Yeah. I, I think it's um, one very important uh, determinant of what gets talked about and what policy gets made for in, in climate and forests is what can be measured scientifically. And so you hear a lot about reducing, even though RED plus is reducing emissions from deforestation, degradation, enhancing stocks, sustainable management, uh, in the end, 80, 90% of the conversation is about reducing emissions from deforestation. And there's some political reasons for that, but I think the biggest reason is a raw natural science reason, which is that we uh, have gotten quite good at measuring the carbon fluxes from land use change, taking a forest and putting it into agriculture. That's pretty well known. You can track the areas by satellite and you can track the carbon changes. Uh, what's lagging far behind is knowledge and ability to monitor the carbon cycle within land uses, within a forest under different types of management, within these uh, you know, agro-pastoral systems. Um, and so if and, and when the, the raw science is able to catch up, uh, the policy will move forward too. And, and that, will be, that will have a great effect in that it will expand the pool of beneficiaries from those countries, the, the, the more, especially the more wealthy of the developed countries where you see large land use change, to some of the poorer, especially African countries, where what's going on is, is degradation, changes of land use management, and, and drawing down of carbon within the forests. So my, if I had a choice, I'd say work on that. Damn. Yeah, I discussed with my colleagues here working on complex agroforestry systems. Where are the critters to channel my conservation colleagues back in Washington? Um, you know, where do they fit in these systems? How do we fit them in? How do we measure them? We still don't have a lot. We don't really know enough about faunal biodiversity in red. We haven't focused enough attention on it. And we're not going to get the full support of conservation until we can show that uh, faunal biodiversity has a place in these our beloved complex agroforestry systems. Perhaps a charismatic figure. And moles. not as bushmeat necessarily, although I'm not ruling that out either. The, the moles will be whacked, yeah. unless we have the right combinations of carrots and sticks and metaphors. Um, Jacques. 
I think um, if you could uh, up, uh, download the Library of Congress into your brain, uh, you will not really need to do any more research. Um, I'm really wondering, seriously, what do we still have to study? I mean, we always can find something, but uh, every time we think we have a great idea, if we do a broad literature review, we can find out that someone already addressed that, and maybe even 20 years ago. Um, but something you can, something you will still need is, um, I mean, once you have uh, downloaded your, the Library of Congress, if you go to work with a community or in an administration with a ministry or with any institution, that doesn't mean you're going to be able to solve the problem. That doesn't mean you have the solution. So what you can still do is solve the problem with them using all the Library of Congress that's in your brain, or at least everything that you can reasonably acquire as knowledge. So that means that maybe the kind of research we, we have to do now should be more involved. And there are various schools of that. We call that action research, although you have to be very careful about the world because it's like a cream cake, you know. Uh, you can put everything under a world. It doesn't mean that it's actually that. But um, yeah, I think uh, the way to make one more step is to be really engaged in stakeholder and because that's the way we can learn the, the, the stuff that are still missing. Maybe I will add to that. There, there are some physical science questions that we're still in our very, very early uh, stages of understanding. Um, you talked about the uh, certainty engaged with uh, carbon modeling at a um, big scale. Um, the uh, greenhouse gases that are implicated in agriculture, the uh, nitrous oxide and methane, uh, some of those are, uh, there's, there's still a lot uh, to be uncovered about how those fluxes work, how those cycles work. Um, did an interesting back of the envelope on Canada's uh, reporting of their nitrous oxide emissions and the uncertainty uh, that was implicated in that meant that if there was a not unusually wet year in southern Ontario under regular fertilization regimes, that there was an uncertainty in that greenhouse gas emission that exceeded the entire civil aviation uh, sector of Canada, uh, just based on what may or may not have been volatilized through fertilization under not abnormal conditions. These are still areas where the models are far from clear when it comes to some of these greenhouse gases. Um, but my interest is really in, uh, as, as a research question, is how can we uh, capture value and communicate value from multiple functions? Um, how can we take all of the benefits that are purported for these systems that offer the resilience that they're touted for and actually identify what those are and communicate them using, hopefully, the, the, <coughs> the quality turn, uh, which is the interest in uh, the urbanizing population uh, growing in wealth who wants more quality, either through uh, health or through impact on a larger environment. Uh, how do we bridge that gap between saying, here's the multiple values, uh, we've expressed them, and we can market them and tie them to that uh, growing in affluence urban consumer, uh, which is popping up like moles everywhere. Um, with that, though, I want to uh, thank very much uh, the panel, uh, all of the attendees here, and turn it back over to Julia to uh, give the final housekeeping and uh, thank yous and farewells. I just want to thank the panelists again. Um, can we give them some applause for coming here and having such <laughs> And also to our moderators, thanks Mark for doing such a great job. And our poster presenters, thank you so much. They're fantastic. And again, to the ISTF team here, I can't think of people I would rather work with and have organized this conference with. You guys are amazing. Uh, OK. Go away. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, um, and uh, I just want to remind you guys, everyone, that all of these panels and discussions are available on the Yale YouTube um, right now. So you can share them with collaborators and students and colleagues. And I hope that we can keep discussing how to coordinate agriculture and forestry and nutrition. Um, and the panelists who need rides downtown, 
um, or to the train station, please meet at the reception table. And also ISTFers.